Cheers, y'all. Well, 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 well. Ooh, a party. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this fine radio program, podcast, and video extravaganza known internationally as the world-famous Smokin' and Toastin'. We are here on show number 223. Uh, we're all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand-rolled cigars, and we welcome you to show 220. 230. Did I say 223? It's 233. 233. We're, yeah, because we're we are, halfway to 300 That's now, right. right. So, yeah, it puts us right there at that halfway point. So it's perfect. Um, we are brought to you by MyCigarShirts.com. Great shirts for cigar lovers and the people who love them. On the web at MyCigarShirts.com. The shirts start under $20. There's a nice variety of, you know, really cool snarky cigar sayings and things that you'll enjoy if you're a, if you're a lover of the leaf um, mycigarshirts.com because cigars yes sir uh, we are excited about today's show well we're always excited because there's usually you know drinking and 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 talking about tobacco afoot but uh, today we're particularly excited because we have our second appearance of Whistlepig on the show, and our first appearance of Doug Ward. Doug, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. What is your official title at Whistlepig? National Brand Ambassador. Okay, so National Brand Ambassador. So we'll get into that. We uh, were very fortunate to have Dave Pickerel on the show a little before uh, he unfortunately passed, and yeah. uh, it was it was a great show. It was super fun. The whiskey was amazing. He was his usual self, as you can uh, imagine. At yes, least. and yes. Uh, and we had a we had a blast with him. But we are thrilled to be returning to Whistle Pig. And I know I already know this, but you brought the um, the uh, the one that is uh, very much talked about here mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. this is your uh, slightly lower priced entry into the uh, into correct. the whiskey world. It's a piggyback, and so I've been dying to try that. So I'm excited to have. Well, I'm excited dying for to pour it, it for you. And of course, I'm not at all excited about the ten year and the twelve. Well, no, that, no, 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 not at all. Just yeah. that uh, that won't be that won't be a high point of the show for me. Maybe Ian, but not me. Um, so we're uh, we're full of fun stuff to talk about and to do and to taste today. We will be tasting some beers from Nashville, Tennessee, and the Southern Grist Brewing Company. Their Southern Crisp Pilsner style. I don't think we've Love had it. anything from Southern. I, I don't Grist. think we've had anything from Nashville actually. So this is a first uh, first on the show. Ian's waving you down. Oh, okay. Uh, from Dallas, Texas, and Oak Highlands Brewery. <clears throat> One of my favorite uh, beer names in a while. It is a brown ale with Texas pecans, and it's called Tejano Pecano, nice. which I thought was Are an you awesome. familiar with them already? Yeah. No, 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 not. They're, they're out of Dallas. Uh, now, you're a Texas guy, right? Yep, fifth generation. <clears throat> fifth generation Texan. Okay, so we're based in Houston, but of course heard all over the world, so we try to keep our bragging about our home state to a minimum. Not Texans love Texas. It's just a thing, you know. I've lived in a lot of different states across the country, and there is no state with a sense of itself the way Texas has. It's just a thing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no, there are no bumper stickers in Massachusetts with the shape of the state that say secede. None of them, you know. You just don't find <laughs> or it. Or native. Yeah, right. Exactly. But don't mess with Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen a sticker that says, "I wasn't born in Idaho, but I got here as quickly as I could." You know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but in Texas, you do see those things. At it's every just, truck stop. It's just a Texas <laughs> yes. thing. So, uh, Also in the beer category today, uh, from Portland, Oregon, a hotbed of craft beer activity. Uh, we will be sampling something from Gigantic Brewing Company. We've had, oh, some we've had quite a few from beers them, yeah. on there before. Yes, this is their most premium Russian Imperial Stout aged in scotch barrels. So very excited about that. Uh, about this. That it's, sounds awesome. It's got a big 21 on it, which I believe refers to the fact that it's a 2021 release, not that the scotch barrels were from 21-year-old scotch, but uh, we'll, we'll, see how it, we'll see how it plays out anyway. So uh, looking forward to that. Um, we will uh, tell you about some new cigars to watch for. There's some very interesting things hitting stores as we speak. Uh, and of course, we'll have our uh, normal uh, segment, Drinking News, our Drinking News teaser headline today. Go ahead and give me a little, uh... there you go. Our teaser headline today is, uh, Trump should have taken a cue from this guy. 
and we'll uh, we'll tell you what that's all about coming up. Um, oh, I, I wanted to mention too. Uh, we wanted to thank our guest uh, from last week, Lori Nadu. Uh, she is the gal in the polka dot dress from the Smoke and Mary. Uh, uh, Bloody Mary Mix Company. Yes. And she did wear the polka dot dress, and she looked great. And uh, most importantly, though, once again, it was proved out that smoking and toasting, this show, directly influences sales. That's right. Because you went and bought some Smoke and Mary I did. This week, I was, I was chatting with uh, one of my buddies in the brew club. He uh, listens to us all the time, so if you ever hear me talk about Josh, he's like, man, I really want to try some of those. And so I ordered a six-pack this was somewhere around 10 o'clock-ish or 10.30-ish on mm-hmm. Tuesday night. They arrived at my house at noon today. Wow. Like, that's fast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's prime fast. Yeah. That's, like, really fast. So are you using them for Bloody Marys? I took. Uh, we had. I had about half a bottle of the one that was left over last week. I took it home. My wife has already cooked with it. It's gone. Oh. So. <laughs> so I still have some of the uh, some of the green with envy one, the Tomatillo mm-hmm. oh, one. Oh yeah, yeah. That is uh, uh, that is quite good. I had uh, a couple margaritas after the show last, and uh, margaritas, uh, uh, Bloody Marys, Bloody Marys after the show last week. Um, and I haven't touched it since, but I haven't been doing a lot of cooking either. I, well, I did a little grilling and stuff, but I haven't used it. Um, but I did order a six pack, which was two of each flavor, uh, because we're gonna uh, I'm gonna bring that to the. Uh, to the meeting uh, on Tuesday for my brew club, and we're oh. going to have a Bloody Mary evening. So so your Try brew club will, will uh, change up and go Bloody Mary for, yes, the, for yes. the evening. Very interesting. <laughs> we do we do little events like that. Sometimes we have 80s nights where everyone has, has to bring 240 ounces. Yeah. Um, so, sometimes we have uh, massive amounts of tasters that get passed around. I think our record is like 17 tasters in one night. <laughs> um, mostly due to Joel from Eureka Heights. Uh, out of his, uh, he has a walk-in beer fridge right right house, right so, so that, that that helps uh, <laughs> that's nice you mentioned having bloody mary's after you got home from the show last I week uh, i don't know if i could have had more bloody mary's after i got home. you know that's the thing about it was vodka. a couple like, hours like, after i got home and i was like i think i could use another one of those like today we'll be you know sampling the whistle pig and we'll be sipping it because that's the appropriate way to enjoy it you know and so the the tastings will be small and measured there's something about vodka, though, whether it's in martinis or gin and martinis or or whether you make Bloody Marys. I mean, you just kind of drink that yeah, stuff down. Yeah, it just kind of goes back a so little bit fast. It's not so much that vodka impacts me more than other spirits. It's that I have a tendency to drink it faster, <laughs> you know, uh, because you, you always want it cold and you always want it, uh, you know, to, to be, you know, something that you – drink in larger gulps as opposed to sip and enjoy. Uh, that's why it seems like I'm always out of vodka, but I still got a little whiskey left, if that makes sense. <laughs> there you so, go. Uh, all right, so a lot of other things going on on the show today, including, by the way, uh, you'll, you'll love this, Ian, um, the newest band to jump on the We're Releasing Our Own Beer bandwagon um, is releasing Hellcat. It's the new beer from Iron Maiden. <laughs> from Iron Maiden. You know, so that's a Robertson's uh, Brewing Company is yeah. making the Iron Maiden beers. The mm-hmm. Trooper. They yeah. have, uh, I think, an Ace is High. Um, but the Trooper is a good beer. Mm-hmm. It's it's it's, well, uh, it's a pale ale. It's really, really good overall. Well, listen, not every celebrity product is just, you know, a vanity thing. Like... The Metallica Blacken, for example, was, you know, that was distilled by uh, Dave Pickerel, formerly uh, with Whistlepig. So, you know, and we've had that. It's it's delicious. Yeah. So not every celebrity product. We had the Codigo. We can't all be Conor McGregor. Right. <laughs> That's for sure. And thank God I for that. I love the look on everyone's face when we mention that <laughs> atrocity. I know. It's uh, it's pretty much universal for anyone who's uh, you actually You know, though, it, it kind of so. fits his profile. That's, that's a whiskey that you have to fight on the way in and on the way out, man. <laughs> I think that makes sense. It kind of does. Of course, he sold it. Now he made, you know, millions of dollars off like, it. Like, so. who decided that yeah, we who decided, really need that? I want this and and Connor won't be involved anymore. Doesn't that seem like a bad marketing decision? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that seems you got to fight that me. whiskey all the way down. That's <laughs> well, he's got to get back to fighting, right? Right, right. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. And you can't drink too much whiskey 
and be in the ring regularly. So, you yeah. know, you would think. Um, I don't know. It certainly keeps me in fighting shape. But mm. what I'm fighting is definitely a bit different. So <laughs> <laughs> let's, just, let's just put it that way. So uh, it's been a crazy week for me. Uh, and I have, uh, a, you know, just been feels like running 100 miles an hour. So it feels good to be in the studio, take a deep breath and do some tasting. What uh, What about you? Do you have an opportunity to I smoke did. I went by uh, Casa, said hi to the guys today, man. They're so nice over there. Love uh, those guys. And I wandered around the... Wandered around the humidor, found a few things that I hadn't had before. Uh, I up. just wanted to mention last week the cigar you chose to smoke was exactly the same one, and we That's that I so smoked, hilarious, and we didn't know a we thing never about, talk it. about right. that at all. So I'm um, I'm just waiting to see if that happens again. What did you smoke? So I grabbed one off the end cap. Uh oh. <laughs> Marketer's <laughs> dream that I hadn't had. Yeah. Um. Actually, I, gra- I grabbed a few, but the one I decided to smoke was the Arturo Fuente Casacuba. Okay, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been hilarious. So. If that happened two weeks in this a row, this is that'd the be- uh, Doble Trace. Uh, it's a five and a half by forty four cigar. So it was a Corona. Um, the wrapper is Ecuadorian Habano with uh, Dominican binder and filler. Uh, the appearance on this medium brown, um, oily, semi smooth, uh, all the way down the length of it, firm overall, with a uh, kind of a classy single band, really nice looking cigar, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and a little on the smaller side. I just figured, you know, I'll try yeah. something, uh, try something a little smaller than I usually do. Uh, the pre light sniff had a lot of earth, coffee, a little malt, a little hay it's in a there. Gorgeous cigar, by the way. Yeah, yeah, it's it's real pretty. The uh, the pre light uh, clip I use the, the pre light draw. I used the clip on it. The draw was uh, was a slight uh, slight draw on it. Not super effortless, but pretty close. You okay. know, um, the the pre light draw had uh, notes of rich earth, coffee, leather, cedar, hints of baking chocolate in there. Um, the uh, initial light on this, big spicy pepper, earth, leather, baking chocolate, cedar, all those things in the pre light sniff came through right with the initial light on that. Uh, the first third of this, peppery and sweet, surprisingly complex, uh, sweet underlying fruit, maybe fig kind of thing mm. going on, uh, dark kind of That's fruit thing going on, uh, baking chocolate, bitter coffee, cedar, leather. White pepper, the retro hail's earthy, peppery, slightly citrusy. Uh, the retro hail's real pleasant uh, overall on this thing. Uh, solid ash, good burn. The second third of this, white pepper and bitter sweetness kind of create the foundation of the flavor on this cigar. Cedar and leather kind of layer nicely with a light topping of malt and coffee. Medium strength, solid ash, great burn overall. It was a little uneven at the the, the beginning of the uh, second third, but then it just evened itself out. I never tended it or anything. Um, the last third of this, uh, coming off of that, uh, uh, all those great flavors, it went out. Uh oh! It just you had died. this problem a couple weeks ago. Like too. I just I, I had it in my hand, and you're smoking it like regularly. I finished right? writing the last sentence of my uh, last third, which I do in little parts. It's not like I spent a lot of time. I mean, it was probably a couple minutes. And it was just out when I went to take my next puff. I was like, okay, that's weird. So I relit it. And uh, I relit it with no penalty. It was actually uh, it just fired right back up pretty nice. It was good. And um, and I paused for just a second and it went out again. Uh-oh. Yeah, I get one of these here. Mm-hmm. So I relit it the second time. And uh, it picked up a little harshness. So this on time a, there was a relight penalty. A, yeah, there was a little relight penalty to it. Picked up a little harshness. Uh, I decided to power through it a little bit. The harshness backed off, um, uh, backed off a little bit. Uh, the retro hail was still very pleasant on this cigar. Uh, it remained palatable with just a hint of harshness uh, throughout the rest of the cigar. Solid ash, good burn overall. Aside from the fact that it went out, uh, this is a nine dollar and forty cent. Cigar though. See, you don't expect a cigar that's in the ten dollar range, nine to ten dollar range, to go out on you a couple it gets of times. A four. Ooh, it's a four. If it didn't go out on me, it would have gotten a five pretty easily. But it gets a four. Just like I'm sorry, but if I have to relight it twice, and <clears throat> I'm pretty good at smoking cigars, so I don't. <laughs> You've think had it some was practice, user haven't error. you? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I practice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> eh, yes I eh, user error. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, Doug, the way our uh, price to quality scale works when we talk about cigars is that it's a 1 to 10 scale, but a 5 means that we're talking price to quality, so it means you got exactly what you paid for. Right. So a 5 is a great rating. If something pulls above a 5, wow, it either was just way exceptional, or maybe it was a lower-priced cigar that smoked like a higher-priced cigar. If it gets below a 5, 
That doesn't necessarily mean the cigar wasn't good. It just means maybe at its price range, it didn't quite pull its weight. Yeah, if this was a $6 cigar, the whole thing that it went out and everything would have been a little more forgivable. Mm -hmm. But it, at almost $10, right. I mean, it's $9.40. So let's just call it a $10 cigar for practical purposes mm -hmm. by the time uh, you pay taxes and get out of there. Uh, at a $10 cigar, for it, for it to just go out on me twice, mm, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with sorry, you. it knocks it down. I'm with you. Absolutely. So I had an interesting one. In fact, I, I, I just have to kind of, I'll preface this by saying, I think I may be in love. Uh-oh. Uh, I smoked a Southern Draw Rose of Sharon Those are great. Desert Rose. Have you had the Desert Rose? Yes. It has, the band has, it, it's like pink. Like uh -huh. when you pick it up. It almost looks like it's the it's a girl cigar yes. that you give, that people give out at weddings, right? Because it's just a, a very unusual color. Not for it's a, a band. girly cigar, but the ones that the actually ones say that, it's a girl. That say yeah, it's yeah. a girl, but you give out when somebody. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this was the uh, Rose of Sharon Desert Rose Bellicoso Fino, uh, which essentially means a medium short torpedo. I have actually had one of those, and it's funny you say that because I smoked one just like. Late last week. See, so you could have been reviewing that I one today. <laughs> that would have been that would have been weird. Is what it would have been. It would have been weird. So Southern Draw is a small boutique uh, cigar company, and their cigars are rolled. Guess where, Ian? At the uh, AJ Fernandez. Yep, at the AJ yep. Fernandez factory in Este. Uh, Esteli, well, Robert Holt knows uh, what he's Nicaragua. doing. Well, absolutely. And you know, me being an AJ fanboy, I didn't know. I didn't have know the connection until I looked it up, and I was like, okay, my expectations may have ticked up a notch here or two, because I just love uh, what AJ does, and the people in his factory roll great cigars. The qualities are there. I don't know that he was involved in this blend, but I, I, well, I know I'll that's where they up. put it together. Well, I'll step it up one more. I haven't had a cigar from them that's been... Less than that's been subpar. Really yeah. good. Yeah, absolutely. All their cigars are great. Southern what, Draw just makes great cigars. What's interesting and different about the Desert Rose is that even though it is touted as a medium to full bodied smoke, the tobacco in it is not exactly what you might expect for that. It is a cigar that uses filler tobacco from Honduras and the Dominican Republic, binder from Nicaragua, and for the wrapper, an Ecuadorian Connecticut shade wrapper. So now you've got this lighter colored cigar, and most of us, when we see the Connecticut Shade wrapper, we're thinking something that's lighter, maybe toasty, right. you know, maybe very enjoyable, but not as not going to have as much fullness and maybe as deep a flavor. Uh, it's just going to be one of those lighter uh, smoking experiences. So I was very curious. I clipped the top with my cigar center, uh, my cigar scissors. I lit it with a one flame torch. The initial blast of pepper on this thing reminded me of like a Nicaraguan Puro. Like it was just that that full first puff of pepper. Uh, and it actually had a little bit of, a little tiny touch of bitterness to it. But fortunately, that disappeared very quickly. And the Desert Rose settled into an immediately complex and very rich now, smoke. This from is the a beginning. blend that he uh, made for his wife. That's right, I'm because correct. his wife's yeah. name is Sharon. Yes. So Rose of Sharon has a number of different meanings, and but in this case Sharon it's a Sharon likes to a little bigger cigar flavor-wise. Yeah, apparently so. So this is box pressed and it's short, but the flavor was definitely big on this thing uh, from the very beginning. Immediately complex and and pretty rich as well. Right away I got a, uh, a note of velvety creaminess. It was very smooth, enjoyable vibe that brought along some leather and spice, spice notes, a bit of toasted almond uh, on the tongue. Uh, the burn for the first third as close to perfect as I've ever seen. I mean, you go, yeah. AJ. I mean, it was just it was just fantastic. Uh, second, third continued to have this creaminess that was kind of like buttered toast. You know when you, you know when you butter toast and you butter it enough that the butter kind of seeps through to yeah, the other yeah, side. Yeah. That's that's what it reminded me <laughs> of. It was just this very, very rich, sort of buttery, toasty uh, flavor, uh, along with white pepper, some other spices I couldn't specifically identify, but they all came across beautifully. It was at this point I was like, okay, I think I may be falling in love with this cigar. So uh, final third ramped up a little bit in strength. The creamy toastiness continued to the end, and uh, a wonderful note of charred wood kind of added to the mix. You know, not not quite campfire, but just like a like like a charred wood barrel mm -hmm. smells. That that kind of a, that kind of a note. Um, honestly, uh, the burn and construction were incredible. Just as good as it gets. This was an amazing cigar. Price to quality, there's two ways to look at this. 
Uh, Desert Rose is a twelve dollar cigar. It is. It is. Crazy. And it's. N- I mean, it's not tiny, but it's not a big cigar either. It's. It's pretty small. I think though that it's a new top three for me, which kind of sucks because I. Yeah, I can't smoke a twelve dollar cigar all the time. That's just not in my. It's just not in my price wheelhouse. You know what I'm saying? Uh, th- that's an occasional for me. But that said, I enjoyed it so much that honestly. If I had paid seventeen or eighteen dollars for it, I wouldn't. I would not have been disappointed. It was that good. So, with all of that said, this is exactly what I'd be looking for in a seventeen, eighteen dollars cigar. So, a big deal for me with a, with a cigar that's, you know, more than ten bucks. But I'm going to give it a seven point five price to quality. That's a big, that big, is a big number one. for yes, me. Yes. You know, and people accuse me of liking everything, but I'm not afraid to so give let out. Me, lower... Let me paraphrase. Let me let me wrap up what you're saying about yeah. this cigar, guys. You see this cigar out there? It is pink. Don't be afraid to smoke right. the pink. Do right. Do not be afraid to smoke the pink, and don't be afraid to uh, you know, to pay twelve bucks for it because it is, I think, more. Robert, if you hear us out it. there, I want a shirt that says "I smoke the pink." <laughs> that would be great. Maybe MyCigarShirts.com will do one of those for us. <laughs> and you don't have to be at a gender reveal party. Right. Exactly. Smoke, right? <laughs> exactly. Or around well, someone named Sharon. What is it with gender reveal parties? They're all like setting forest fires and, and <laughs> killing people. They're and going stuff. too far. They are. It's some Somebody's got to step in and stop the gender reveal party gate. I just like adding gate to everything. That's just, what just, do. just have cigars with the labels printed up. Yeah, yeah, it works perfectly. You know, just and and the reveal can be you open the box and the label's either blue or pink. I'm that okay be, with that. And everybody wins. And everybody wins. All right. Speaking of winning, I am very excited to start tasting Whistle Pig. We'll be doing that in our next segment. Plus, we'll uh, break out our first beer, which is a Southern Crisp Pilsner style lager from Southern Crisp Brewing Company in Nashville, Tennessee. Their first uh, appearance on the show. So excited to uh, try these guys out. And of course, with Whistle Pig in the house, we're always excited. So we will be right back at Smoking and Toasting. Thank you for checking us out for show number 230. Three. Be right back. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome back. It is smoking and toasting the fine sounds of the Suffers, one of the uh, coolest bands in the world. They are uh, based right here in our home city of Houston, Texas, and they are they are uh, they describe their music as Gulf Coast funk. Which I think is awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> I, I love it. You know, it. there was a band uh, here in Houston, the High Tailors. I remember this Gulf band, Coast yeah. Rock and Roll, mm-hmm. and it, that is such a great and apt description because it, it just, it's just different. conjures up images of like alligators on the stage while the it's band just is different. Playing, it's you know? a bluesy, yeah, with some swing. It's just, yeah, it's just a gritty. Fun stuff. Like garage, like it's it's great stuff. Fun stuff. By the way, uh, there's a new uh, name in brewing now. There's a new. A new celebrity name has been added to the list of celebrity beer enthusiasts or beer brewers. And it's the Queen of England. The Queen of England is now selling at her Sandringham estate two beers, a Best Bitter and an Olden IPA, brewed by the royal family. I don't know what to say that. Uh, isn't that crazy? I love that she's doing a bitter though. I yeah, love yeah. bitters. Well, and and you know the the British the British are fond of of bitter beers and and IPAs in general. So I'm not surprised those are the two styles that they sold. But uh, Sandringham Estate is the much loved country retreat of Queen Elizabeth II, and they recently announced they developed two different beers. They began selling earlier this month, and uh, you can look them up online. But they've got um, they kind of look like what the um, uh, what the labels uh, for uh, what's the what's the company that makes the great pale ale out of San Diego with the green bottle? My, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, that uh, I've drank hundreds of times. Sierra. Sierra Nevada. It, yeah, they Sierra look Nevada. like a Sierra Nevada bottle, except if it was designed by someone British. Oh, it's yeah. kind of what they look like. There's pheasants and rabbits and stuff like that. <laughs> on it, you know? It's pretty awesome. There's always so, got to be a pheasant and a shotgun in there somewhere, right? <laughs> if, if it's British, yes, yes. Yeah. A pheasant and a shotgun. Anyway, might be something to check out. I don't know that Where any do you of get that? I don't think it's available stateside. So if we have anybody listening in the U.K., if you send us some Sandringham Estate beer, we will reciprocate by sending you some of the best that Texas had to offer because they're fascinated with Texas in the UK. 
So it might be they might consider that an equitable trade. Christian, if you're listening. Okay, cool, perfect. We have a we, steward in the UK. So. Okay, yeah. Christian, if you can oh, get nice. us some Sandringham <laughs> Estate beer and send it to us, we will make it worth your while. You have our word. You have our word. So speaking of beer, Ian is about to pop the top on this uh, beer from Nashville, Tennessee. And this is a Pilsner. We've had a number of Pilsners and, uh, and lagers on the show over the past, well, really since the, the first of the year. And we have been just continually thrilled at the quality and the craftsmanship of these things. And some of them have become kind of regular rotation items in uh, in Ian's beer fridge as well as mine. So You know one really that I've been buying that. a lot recently is the Eighth Wonder Tex. Oh, that's a, that's a good beer. It's just exactly what I want. It's like if you took Lone Star and tweaked it to be just that much better. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's really, and really Lone good. And Lone Star is, is a beer that is totally fine in a pinch. But if you just took it kind of to the next level, this, which is what they've done this with This has that. a weird malt and citrus nose. Well, oh, you're so right. It's got like a little tangy a citrus kind of above a, a, a sort of a malt base on the nose. And it's really, I don't know, it's really It's not interesting. real fragrant, but it's there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm very much excited to taste this. So, Yeah, like a lemon peel. Yeah. Right, like a lemon zest almost. You lemon know, zest a, and coriander. It tastes like it smells. <laughs> it tastes is, almost exactly like it smells. Which there's is almost not a bad a hint thing. That, there's that there's there's this this crisp uh crisp lemony uh finish to it mm-hmm. almost. And then that rolls off and then there's a little hint of malt left right at the very tail end of that uh flavor. It's really good. How are you liking this? You were said you were excited to Man, I, I could I could crush cans of this. Yeah, crush cans <laughs> yeah, of yeah. this. You mentioned that you're kind of a Pilsner guy. You like the lighter, crisper uh, kind of beers. Uh, this I is do. this is quite good. The liner wises and you know mm-hmm. that that crisp just you know we live in Texas, right? So at the end of the day, um, especially when it's summertime, when, when, yeah. when, when, <laughs> yeah. when it's most months, right? Yeah. Right. Um, this is you know what I gear towards. So, so Southern Gris Brewing is in Nashville, Tennessee. They have this the whole. Can basically has their uh, Southern Crisp on there and kind of a purple uh, uh, script, and then it's behind a big bright sun with the rays going out yeah. uh, radially it's from the fairly from fairly the simple point. can design, but perfectly effective for what for uh, what they're conveying. Unfiltered Pilsner, delicately hopped with Nelson Savon, Savin, Savin, mm-hmm. Nelson Savin. I don't yeah. know how to say this. I Sauvin? think it's Savin, Savin, Savin. Nelson Savin. All right. Brewed and canned by Southern Gris. Uh, according to the Surgeon General, one should not drink alcoholic beverages during pregnancy because yeah. of birth defect. Oh, <laughs> it's like everyone. Right? It's like 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 they, you know, they all use the same they, author on those. Yeah, apparently, whoever wrote that is getting royalties from every beer company because right. that just seems to appear on every can. So, uh, <laughs> so no, but it, I think it's really good. It is very crisp. Uh, so true to its name, but in a slightly different way. I was almost expecting more of like a apple or pear kind of crispness, but it's not that at all. It's mm-hmm. more like that ze- lemon zest uh, lemon crispness zest. on top of this and, layer of malt. And on the long term, on the long term uh, aftertaste, you get that that lemon zest in the very back of the palate that just kind of sits there. It's it's nice. It's like if you had like really nice fresh squeezed lemonade, leaves that yes. same kind of mm-hmm. that's not too sweet, you know. And it kind of creates what I like to call the Dorito effect, which is it makes <laughs> you, you want more. Sipping, yeah, you want yes. another sip. Because I don't know if this is true or not, but for years I've heard that Doritos act that they actually do something in the formula when they make them. They science it. It is genetically or scientifically designed to make you want another one after you finish and after you chew and swallow that's, that's a Dorito. That's called add salt. Is that what it is? <laughs> I don't know, man. I met somebody uh, within the last couple of months uh, at a barbecue joint that was a flavorist for Frito Lay, and mm-hmm. so when she gave me her card and said flavorist, I was like, "Ooh, you're a scientist! Like right, you, right. You, mm-hmm. you, get, you get deep down in there, right? You're creating right, right, right. these flavors." And uh, we had some good, good, fun conversations. Oh, I bet that was awesome. Yeah, awesome. yeah, <laughs> I, bet, I bet it was. Well, I don't know if it's true or not, but I certainly could see where it might be having having eaten a few Doritos in my life. So. I'm trying to cut back on carbs now, and that's the thing I'm missing most, actually, because my wife actually came back from the, from a different store the other day with a bag of the taco Doritos, which you can't find everywhere. Taco flavored Doritos, they're like a they're they're like caviar for people who like <laughs> enjoy crunchy chips, and they're amazing, yeah. and they're sitting unopened in my 
counter right now because I'm like trying not to. You know, uh, uh, just on the evil side of snacks, Ruffles yeah. has their. I think it's the ranch jalapeno ones yes. that came out recently. Oh, I've had that. Oh yes. man. <laughs> Like that's it's so decadent. All right, yeah, that's we got to stop. We got to stop this conversation, <laughs> or I'm going home and eating chips after I have some of the. Uh, some None of, of the us have eaten since here, breakfast. So. I take it. So, right. uh, Doug Ward is our special guest today. Doug is the national ambassador for uh, for Whistle Pig. Doug, I guess first of all, and and uh, I understand you you were like you were a wine guy. Weren't you before you got involved in Whistle Pig? I was, I was, I did um, on prem. So I worked for Crew Wine Bar, which I know you've got two locations, right? Right, I've been um, to Crew here and um, launched the ones that, you know helped in Dallas, moved down to Austin, and then started working distribution supplier, mm -hmm. and then took a role where I was selling wine and spirits, and I, I kind of fell in love with the spirits out of life, right? Yeah, it was something that um, once you've kind of been around wine and you had you know done that. For, for so long, it's a different buyer, it's a different consumer, it's a different mm -hmm. everything, and it was on its way. Whiskey was kind of on its way, and spirits and some of these craft things that I was out launching were so, you it know. Was new at the time, right? Yeah. 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 People didn't know what Martinique rums were or what Amaro was. I was right. explaining to them that Amaro means bitter in Italian, and these pharmacists <laughs> came up with this, and the, you know, and people were like blown away. And, and now you see just, you know, an entire section at the liquor stores. And uh, so it, it, it's really cool and fun to see how things, you know, have, have you know, just developed and you know mm -hmm. moved forward well yeah in the spirits category i mean i you know I, I love tequila and i remember when you'd go to your typical uh spirit store and there'd be maybe 10 different brands of tequila now it's a full aisle and there's you know different iterations you've got you know the blanco and the reposado and the añejo of all these different brands and sometimes the Añejo Extra and it's like and, and and the same thing has happened if, if a store only has one aisle of whiskey at this point you need to go to a different store because the you know now uh, the specs that I like to go to down in, in Midtown that's close to my house I mean they're, they're they've got an aisle for Irish whiskey they've got an aisle for mm -hmm. scotch they've got an aisle Whole for bourbons sections, yeah. got an aisle for, uh, half an aisle or so of rye i mean it's just it's like it's crazy how much this whole thing has exploded and obviously whistlepig has had no trouble finding their market in the middle of all of this because your name has become such a such a big deal but do you think is it with so much selection now is it tougher you think for new Whiskies or new bourbons coming onto the market to to find traction or are people looking for new? What do you think? I think it's a little bit of both. I think yeah. people are always going to be looking for new because there's still so many new people coming to the category, mm -hmm. right? Right. Um, but I also think that now with uh, bars and restaurants coming back online, that's a big, huge help to those brands oh, that are starting. Time. Yeah. Because, I mean, let's be real. This is what we started with. This is what mm -hmm. brought us to the dance. This is what we launched our company with, mm -hmm. right? And there would be none of these other whiskeys on this table if not for the success of Ten Year, right? And the innovation of Dave. And, and our... that was the first one that you tried, right? Was the Ten Year? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And and but it wasn't uh, it wasn't somebody reaching on a retail shelf and buying a seventy five dollar bottle at that time that made us who we are today. It was bartenders. Right, it was people introducing them to it one right. pour at a time. When right. someone buys a bottle at and takes it home, they've they already drink, had it somewhere, right? Probably, but most likely, yeah. And people aren't really rolling dice on a seventy-five dollar bottle that they've never heard of. Sure. And and people are just more educated now. Now people know what uh, age statements are, and that mash bills matter, and proof delivers flavor, and mm -hmm. things like that, right? Sure. So they're more educated, which which actually awesome. is in turn helping not only our brand but all whiskey brands sure so that you know people can see through if it's not a good product no matter what it is right it might not have longevity Connor because McGregor. of that <laughs> no matter who puts it out <laughs> right no matter what celebrity whether, whether there's a celebrity yeah. behind it or gets involved with it or whatever um at the end of the day if it's good it's good if it's not it's not <laughs> and you know that's kind of you know the basis for you it. know like my whole journey with with Tasting whiskey. Oh, I, I love, love that, that sound. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So uh, clearly, Doug has figured out that we use only high tech sound effects here and spare every expense. <laughs> this is the plastic coming off the top of the. <laughs> That's awesome. And then this is my favorite. Oh, there oh, it is. That was so glorious. My whole journey with uh, tasting whiskeys, um, I went from being a little bit of a Scotch snob mm -hmm. to 
uh, being not much of a snob at all, I love a ton of what we call cheap whiskeys. There's mm -hmm. some great ones out there. There really are. There's, There's some great whiskeys for dollars a the, bottle uh, yeah. that are amazing. I know it's amazing. Yeah. I'm absolutely blown away by how good some of these are. When you when you stop, you know, like when you're a kid and I'm a kid in your 20s and all that, and you're always doing a shot. Of whiskey, right? Everything tastes like crap when you do a shot. Of course, of it. yeah. That's why you have just burns like, your throat. That's and then why you, you go, have you know okay, sex I'm on the beach and, yeah. and uh, uh, on all those other like frou frou shots and stuff that you could take, but uh, birthday cake and all those other ones. <laughs> uh, but uh, but when you stop and take a sip of a lot of these, I'm absolutely blown away by how good some of yeah, those are. Some of them are absolutely. And when you get to this level, it's just. It's, just, it's game changing. It, you know? it absolutely is. Uh, Doug, were you uh, involved? You were at Whistle Pig while Dave uh, Pickerel was still there, mm -hmm. still doing his thing, right? Correct. So um, when he passed away, did that mean that you were stepping into a larger role, or were you already an ambassador just working different locations? Or So I was the steward of the brand for Texas, Texas, Louisiana chief of sales for the central region. Then I went out to launch Piggyback uh, mm -hmm. across seven markets in 19 and still managed uh, a team of two in, in three state markets. And uh, Texas obviously being one of them where I'm based. And then Dave passed. And the only reason that I'm the national brand ambassador, because Dave was our national brand ambassador, right. is because of Dave. And he was my mentor and, uh, you know, um, very unfortunate, but at the same time, man, he had so much to do with everything we're going to talk about today. Right. And so much. And I'm so glad that he was able to be here for your podcast I'm prior. Absolutely blown away by the fact that we got to meet him and talk to him. And I'm so sad that he's gone right now. And uh, But I'm, I'm so glad that that our timing was such yeah that we were able to have yeah. him on and he was just you know he was one of the best guests ever. I mean, he was just like full of energy and light. when you have someone on, you know, people come on the show obviously to promote their brands and mm -hmm. and their and their whiskey or beer or cigars whatever like that's what you expect you expect them to tell you why they're good why they're great but there's a certain element that some people have who come on that they're just so enthusiastic and so in love with what it is they're doing that that is absolutely contagious and yeah. Dave Dave was you know maybe one of the best examples ever of that guy. He absolutely yeah. loved this stuff and his passion for it just was infectious when you were around him. Absolutely. So Ian, I see you uh, doing a little research there. <laughs> <laughs> now this is the Farmstock Rye, is that right? That's correct. So right. this is the third edition of Farmstock. Okay. Uh, the first one was, uh, so first and foremost, Farmstock, any stock that's going to come out from Whistlepig is going to be triple tour base. So it's going to be rye grown on our farm, distilled on our property, and put into Vermont oak casks. Okay. Right? So when we started the company, it was always in the brand. It was uh, a defunct dairy farm in Vermont to uh, make a luxury rye product, an age statement, hunter proof, you know, high rye mash bill, incredible, something that no one had ever seen before. But at the end of the day, it was always to be a grain to bottle distillery as well. Mm -hmm. And um, luckily, having 500 acres that grows rye in Vermont right. uh, allows us to do that. Um, it took a little bit of extra time to get the distillery running because there were some neighbors that liked to fight that their blueberries weren't going to grow because <laughs> of the stills. Um, but By the way, we have a drinking news story about neighboring farmers in a little dispute today. So Ooh, that, nice. that'll fit right in. That with fits your right in. Yeah. 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 So this is the third edition, and it is actually 52% of our own rye. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, three years old. So every edition of farm stock, one, two, and three, one year, two year, three year. Right? So this is a blend of straight rice. And 52% uh, of it is our own distillate. Which is cool. It is but, spicy. Yeah, it mm -hmm. really is. It's mm -hmm. like, and I, I would think this would go wonderfully with a good medium-bodied cigar. Oh, absolutely. Just, just marry right up, as you like to say, form like Voltron. So this makes me think La Carême. Yeah. Yeah. With this. Mm -hmm. With the chocolatey creaminess of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, cigar uh, paired with this, with a little bit of spice to it. This is uh, this is just absolutely delicious, and it it is okay. I don't know if this is going to come out right, but I'll say what I'm thinking. Uh, it it seems like it's a little more flavorful than some whiskeys. The flavor is more pronounced. Does that 
Does that make sense? Do you, yeah, am I so, saying that right? So character? Character, maybe, yeah. Yeah, flavor, yeah. character. It's, maybe it's the more spicy nature of it that, that just makes it, it seems, it just feels more pronounced like you know what you're tasting here, you know? And that's kind of what we want with everything that we do. We want you to know the difference between each one of these bottles as ours is in front of us today. But more importantly, you know, rye is a blending um, grain. It's right. in every bourbon, right? Mm -hmm. But what we do is rye um, until later on this year. Okay. Um, but so, uh, That's well, big. Yeah, that's big well. news. Yes. Yeah. The big news. So, all right. So we'll get to that later. Yep. Plus, I want to talk about um, uh, why you think Dave uh, Pickerel was – what was his, like, ESP that he had that – because when he started doing rye, rye was not a thing at that moment. Yeah. And so I want to ask you a little bit about that and find out about what your non-rye product might be that's coming. Plus, we'll do more tasting, and uh, we have a uh, we have a pecan beer to taste next, a brown ale uh, with Texas pecan. So we'll get to that coming up in the final, in the not the final segment, but the next one. You are tuned into Smoking and Toasting, show number two hundred and thirty-three, and we will be right back. Welcome back, my friends. It's Smoking and Toasting, show number 223. We're all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand-rolled cigars. And we are brought to you by MyCigarShirts.com. They are a wonderful supporter of the show, so we encourage you to support them. MyCigarShirts.com, great shirts for cigar lovers. Online, MyCigarShirts.com, because... Cigars. Yes, sir. That's um, easy for you to say. <laughs> maybe or maybe not. Um... Doug from Whistlepig is here. He's just poured. I, I, you got to show the camera that. Can I see that for just a second? Oh, please. <laughs> that, Look that at this poor spout. Poor spout. This uh, poor spout. That is awesome. Is that is, is a pig's head in the? Now is that a Whistlepig thing or is that something you found? Oh and no, thought that's would be a cool? Whistlepig thing. That's okay. uh, for the the on prem trade. So for bars and restaurants that put it into the well and and have a cocktail on the menu we've got some of those too. awesome yeah I that is that. amazing speaking of cocktails i was going to mention that uh, farmhouse rye that we just had i can imagine that spicing up a cocktail and still having the flavor of it punching through oh a sidecar uh, in a with wonderful that? way oh, man that'd be That's, fantastic it's, it's hard to hide any of our whiskeys in a cocktail yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really right is. they kind of jump out and say uh taste me look at me yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah, they stand absolutely up. so i'm really fascinated by uh this next whiskey yeah. it's aged for six years mm -hmm. and Smells it like is it is your um lesser priced uh whiskey in your line the piggyback correct um yet this came out after you already had the 10 year and the 12 year so it's not just like okay we got we haven't got to our more age stuff yet, so in the meantime, we'll release this. This is something you came at kind of after the fact. Tell me, so, tell me where this came from. So we launched with Ten Year once right. again on rescued. Uh, we'll talk about Ten Year more uh, next, but rescued barrels from 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 Alberta that we brought to Vermont to bottle and and create the luxury category, which is anything over seventy five dollars. Mm -hmm. Right, um, we still own that category. 64% yes. of it, right? No kidding. Um, 12 year, took about three years. Um, we were developing everything for farm stock. 15 year, 18 year, boss hogs intermittently. But the one thing that we were really missing in the in the portfolio in the lineup was the... The, the under 70. The, 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 the yeah. thing that would fit into the well, that could be versatile, could be just a, a, a very... It could be a beer and a shot. It could be in a cocktail. It could mm -hmm. be neat. What's it could be with one cube. price point on that one? $49.99 nice. SRP. Right, that's nice. great. So when you know and you talk to people that are whiskey fans or they're finding their way into the trade, people are willing to spend forty to fifty dollars to you know see what's out there. Sure, right, absolutely. And it's, and, it's, and it's still for someone who buys spirits on a somewhat regular basis, that's still a I don't know too much about it, but I'm willing to try it sort of price point. Right, correct. correct. Yeah. And that was really based off of um, ten years' success, and people always being like, "Man, I wish a poor spout went in. I wish it fit in my hand. I wish it fit in the well. I wish it, you know all these things." Right, right. But but in the big picture, this is back to Dave. Dave, when he left Maker's Mark after fourteen years, and he was not only uh, a distiller and a chemist and a savant with the distilling, he was a historian, right? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, he saw the glutton of whiskey in the eighties and nineties, and we all remember 
roughly what that looked like. But he he keyed in on that and saw when American whiskey and bourbon started hitting stride, he was like, man, rye was first. Rye right. was the original. But at that American time, spirit. rye was not nearly as popular. There was three or four players on the retail shelf. I mean, so so he sort of rolled the dice on this to be complete honest. I mean, roll he, of the dice. He he knew what he was doing, knew what he was talking about. But you can't necessarily predict what will be next in terms of mm -hmm. the public's uh, appetite, right? No, but once again, the history showed that all the Sazeracs, Old Fashions, Manhattans were all made with rye, right? Right. And so he felt like there was going to be a transition from sweet to savory. There was going to be people that were going to want these classic cocktails. And when he saw bartenders started, you know, these cocktail dens started popping up all over the country, mm -hmm. right? And they're all putting rye into these classic pre-prohibition cocktails so this is what this is an homage to dave this right. came out after dave passed right right but if you look on all the other labels you'll see uh winston churchill as a pig mm -hmm. right Top right, right. And, right, right, right you know all that um you saw dave you yep. know dave that's dave as a pig on the piggy bank <laughs> right so <laughs> he's got totally the stetson on yeah, i'm always with the flat bill dave always had it stetson that's totally um, him yes. 96.56 proof so dave was born in 56 so uh, that's an homage nice. to his birth year. That's so cool. Um, year of birth and death on the neck here, and then a nice quote from Dave on the back. I would I would challenge you really to find another whiskey at uh, at this price point that is as flavorful. This, as this. is uh, like a cinnamon bomb. Right. It absolutely it is, is. It is cinnamon. Uh, it is. There's a little almost a a raw sugar like the turbinado sugar almost flavor to it, and then there's this um, great like. Vanilla thing that happens on the very tail end. It's it is. Just, it's yeah. as wonderful. And it's spicy. It's, it's spicy as wonderful the on the way. retro hail as you can get. I mean, it's just got that beautiful finish to it, and that next moment where you'd go, "Wow, I'm drinking something really special." And honestly, if you had poured this and not told us it was, you know, your lower priced whiskey, I, I wouldn't have batted an eye. If you just said this is something new we have and it, it was in your same price range as the others, I, that wouldn't have phased me at all. It does not. I guess what I'm saying it doesn't. It doesn't taste like it's designed to be the discount uh, product. Uh, not that anything whistle big is discount, but you understand what I'm saying, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's it's fantastic. I'm uh, I'm impressed. And so at a what fifty dollar price point, um, wow. I'm for it. Tough challenge. Whiskey good. Well, there's not a rye whiskey on any shelf or any back bar in North America, or really the world for that matter, that is going to have the age statement 100% rye in this proof mm. and deliver at even remotely close to it's, this price point. I just can't get over how awesomely spicy it is. And the spice is not like a... It's not like if you have like a jalapeno, right? It's not. It's not. It's not a, it's not a way back in your throat. spice. It's more of it's a. It's right there towards mm -hmm. the like the the back of the middle of the palate, and it's mm -hmm. just just this big warm fuzzy feeling. And it is yeah. wonderful. Yep. And and I've drank almost all of this one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we got to take a break. This is a short segment, but we will come back. We're going to go further with the ten year, and then ultimately the twelve year. Plus, I mentioned the beer from Oak Islands Brewery, Tejano Pecano Brown Ale with Texas pecans, and also uh, I, uh, two things I'd like to get to today. I feel like that one's going to go well with rye. I have a feeling it will. Yeah, two <laughs> things I'd like to get to today, if we can. First of all. The origin and the meaning of the phrase "close but no cigar." I have a little uh, linguistic breakdown for All you. Right. I'll tell you where that comes. And secondly, this is actually part of the show title last week, and we got so involved in Bloody Marys that we never got to it. And it's what bartenders involved think involved reads yeah, a little drunk. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, it's what bartenders think about you based on. The drink that you order. Oh, we did it's, tease yeah, that. Yeah, and it's a fascinating thing that came out in BuzzFeed that I wanted to share. So we will try to get to that in the next segment. Plus, drinking news is coming up, of course, and uh, I've already l let the cat out of the bag. It's about farmers' disputes. What could be more exciting <laughs> than a farmer's <laughs> land dispute? You'll find out coming up. Smoking a toast. Welcome back. By the way, put the camera on Ian because I forgot to bend down in my bag and get the uh, get the beer. 
Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Smoking and Toasting Podcast. Live here on Facebook. You did that well. Available for all your uh, listening pleasure on all the podcast mediums very shortly afterwards. I will uh, pass that along to uh, Ian Tapore while I share with you an article. I found this on BuzzFeed, but apparently it originated... <clears throat> on Reddit, uh, you know, it's hard being a bartender. Customers can get sloppy. Uh, drink recipes can be really hard sometimes. The environment can be difficult to work in. You know, it's not all just a guy wiping the bar top with a towel waiting on pretty girls. You know, I mean, that might happen, but not always. Right. Sometimes it's Ian or me and we're grumpy. You know, uh, so so uh, bartenders can be tough uh, uh, in terms of what they have to deal with every day. So a thread on Reddit asked bartenders, what drink makes you hate the person ordering it? And uh, that gave birth ultimately to this list of what bartenders think about you based on the drink that you have ordered. Can I just go ahead and tell you? Sure. Mm. If, if I encounter a rude bartender mm -hmm. that I feel is rude to me for no reason, mm -hmm. I will order multiple um, either gin fizz or Long Island or iced lemon teas. drops or lemon drop, right? Something really hard, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something that's just intensive to yeah. make. Uh, well, the I... lemon drop in and of itself is not too bad, but when you got to make, you know, seven of them, yeah. Blue yeah. blazer. <laughs> that, that, take I'll take a two blue blazers and two gin fizzes, please. Yeah. So this person says, I'm a bartender in Ireland, and people ordering Guinness can be really annoying. Some want the head, the foam on the top of it large. Others want it micro thin. Some people want it topped immediately. Some want you to wait. A few demand you wait up to five minutes. Older drinkers demand the old standard glass, while new drinkers like the new ones with the harp design. So I, I can see where yeah, Guinness drinkers, particularly if you're in Ireland, because, you know, if I'm I, in Ireland, I'm visiting, and I want that experience, right? I like the harp design glass yeah. because it offers a little bit more grip. Mm -hmm. uh, all this and more, which you're supposed to know automatically. Otherwise, they complain. Seven years of bartending, this bartender says, and I have hundreds of Guinness preferences memorized and nothing from my business degree. <laughs> so, uh, so there's one. Uh, here's one that says there's a drink that's literally called the pain in the ass. <laughs> it's half frozen pina colada and half frozen rum runner. Making that drink requires you to make two different frozen drinks at half recipe proportions and then pouring them both into the glass simultaneously. The worst part of making the drink is that they're only ever ordered by people in the biz who think it's funny to do so. So you might remember that, Ian, if <laughs> you're... Pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah, it is order the pain I in the ass. Yeah. Uh, this part, it's got to be more awful to order one of those than yeah. ordering two. Because right. two's probably Because two, you could make two full easy. drinks and then do. You wouldn't have yeah, they to... Yeah, like, batch it. Yeah, you wouldn't have yeah. to half the recipe. Uh, this bartender says, mojitos. I will never in all my days forgive the person who ordered 20 mojitos 10 minutes before the end of a really busy night. My wrist aches just thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> right? Muddle, muddle. Uh, the mojito effect, you make one pair of customers mojitos, two others see them and order them, and then a group of four, <laughs> and then so on, and suddenly you spend a half an hour muddling fresh mint and nothing else is getting done. Uh, uh, this bartender says, any drink they order after waiting to be served for 10 minutes on a busy night, but don't know what they want to order yet. Oh, My that's... That irritate when I'm standing next to somebody who's yeah. next in line and they go, uh Yeah. And, and they go, uh, Dave, what are you having? Snack. I'll have what you're having. Yeah. What's yeah. good? This bartender <laughs> says, yeah, what's good? <laughs> At our bar, we have this drink called unicorn juice that's basically five different types of syrup with a shot of rum that's layered to look like a rainbow. Such a bitch to make and so expensive for only one shot of alcohol. <laughs> that makes sense, right? Uh, this bartender, bartender says, I don't care what they drink, but anyone who snaps their fingers to get your attention is going to be a disaster. Oh, yeah. Those people get served last. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate the one shot, please, this bartender says. What kind of shot? Oh, I don't know, just anything. He hates that person. Says it might seem like a really easy order, but it's not, since you can easily mess up in the customer's eyes. You don't know what they like, right? Either the drink's too sweet or too strong or too expensive. Just think of a shot and order it, damn it. That's what the bartender says. Um, uh, AMF, which is adios MF. 
Uh, it says to me, I just turned 21, so I'm going to get super wasted, spray, spray blue vomit everywhere, and not tip at all. <laughs> also, insert Long Island iced tea. In Long Island iced tea, <laughs> oh, yeah. yep. Double vodka and Red Bull, the bartender says. This is not a drink that is hard to make, but it's designed to get you absolutely shit-faced. So when it's the first drink someone orders, I know I'm in for a rough night with that customer. <laughs> <laughs> this, you're nodding along with this. This, uh, this must, uh, must be something that calls to mind specific incidents. Huh? We've all gone through phases in yeah. our oh, life. Sure, sure. Yeah, the vodka Red Bull drunk is, is kind of a... A zombie. Oh, it's drunk. a rough one. Because you're wi- one. you're kind of wired. I'll just say but drunk. You know, you know what's worse than that though? Jägermeister. A Jägermeister drunk is rough. Uh, rough. I mean, I've had a few of those in my life. Yeah. Uh, this bartender says worked in somewhat nicer college bar for over two years. We didn't get a ton of fancy drink orders most nights anyway. The one that always made me laugh was when anyone ordered well whiskey neat or on the rocks. Mm. <laughs> Being a college bar, that stuff was about as cheap as you can find and it definitely wasn't sipping whiskey. Yeah, so what you were saying earlier about there are some good inexpensive sipping whippies, whiskeys, oh, it's, it's probably not the well, not the well whiskey at your favorite college uh-huh. bar. Uh, this person says, I live in Ireland, so it shows a painful it shows a painful lack of awareness when a tourist orders an Irish car bomb, seemingly without even a tiny bit of questioning of why that might cause trouble in certain parts. Uh, <laughs> no ideas. Yeah. This one uh, uh, dislikes people who order martinis not knowing that they are making faces at the taste of gin. Uh, and this one says, any shot that's served layered when it's super busy. If we're not busy, then it's kind of fun. And uh, a, another person says, um, I'm fine with making complicated craft cocktails, but if after four minutes of me shaving nutmeg and plucking mint leaves, I serve your drink and your indecisive friend goes, oh, that looks good. I'll have one of those. Then it's F you, Craig. <laughs> and they all internally go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Ian, he has picked right up on your sound yes, effects machine, yes. which, is a, uh, which is a wonderful thing. Okay. So we've poured the, uh, we've poured the beer and passed it around, but I, I, do we want to go with the uh, tenure first? Or do we want to start with the beer? Where, where do we go here? I don't know. I, think I feel gonna... like I feel like let's go beer first, and then we'll taste whiskey uh-huh. right after. Because I feel enough. like the whiskey will punch through a little better. Than mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, that's that's around. true. Having had the ten year before, I have no doubt of this. Mm-hmm. So this is a brown ale with uh, Texas pecans. It's called Tejano Pecano, <laughs> and uh, it's a great name. What a and nutty name. It is from Oak Highlands Brewery with the big OHB in their logo. OHB. Uh, Oak, Oak Highlands is an area is of a Dallas. 6.2%. Okay, so it's uh, so and, it's not uh, tiny, but not huge. says on the label, according to the surgeon. Jo- oh, I'm on the wrong <laughs> side. Hold on. <laughs> the, this award-winning brown ale is made with roasted Texas pecans. We roast pecans in the house. And add them directly to the mash. The result is light-bodied beer that is amber in color with the right balance of malty sweetness, pecan flavor. Okay, so tell me your thoughts on this. Mm. <clears throat> well, as I just tasted it, I tried. Um, let me try another one. Mm-hmm. It's a nice beer. I was expecting more. It's got yeah. a lot of pecan shell in it. There's a little astringency to it. Right. And the pecan shell, or you know what? I don't know if you actually call it the shell, but after you shell a pecan, the little it, ridges of shell yeah. that are still in between the, the meat the of the nut. The membrane there. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. right. That's, that's what it kind of reminds me of. Because yeah. when you get one of those, when you're chewing a piece of pecan, you get one of those in there. It always like throws that flavor off just a little bit. I'm going to be honest with you. I wanted a little more sweetness with this. Yes, I agree. Now, this calls to mind a beer that I cannot recommend highly enough, and that is the 512 Pecan Porter out oh, of yeah. uh, 512 Brewing in Austin. That uh, is amazing. That is, to me, if you want to experience that Texas pecan flavor, that's the way to go. This is not bad, but I don't like it nearly as much as I like the 512 Pecan How are you feeling porter. about this one? You, you, you hit it right on the head when you said it doesn't have as much sweetness as I expected. Um, I feel like the the residual sugar would amplify the pecan flavor of it, mm-hmm. but it's not it's not there. It's very balanced, you know. Yes, but it's it not is in easy your to face. drink, right. and it's not in your face. You're absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, and there's nothing about it that is there's nothing about it that doesn't taste good. We might have implied that when talking about the pecan shell or the membrane, but you don't, nothing about this makes you go mm. like it. It yeah. still drinks easy and goes down nice. I bet this is good with dessert, though. 
Mm. Like almost any kind of dessert, I bet this makes a nice one, or uh, an ice cream float would probably be pretty pretty stellar with well, this. I am really curious now of going directly the way, to the tenure after trying If you this. haven't done an ice cream float with beer, yes. do an ice cream float with beer. What beer would you recommend? <laughs> like if you were going to pick one beer to do that with, what would you pick? Guinness. Guinness would and be And a hundred different variations. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can do it with lots. Don't do it with an IPA. That's probably bad. Um, I've never tried it with an IPA, but I'm going to go ahead and project. I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to guess that's not going to be the best. Yes, but no, anything that's big, full bodied, has a little bit of bitterness to it. Like this has a little bitter to it, and so like in a vanilla ice cream, this would be probably pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's a very adult float. A very adult beverage float. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> bold, <laughs> bold flavors, right? It's what yeah. you're always looking for. Yeah, you're looking for bold. So, like, like mm. if you just want to try one off the cuff and you got some, you don't even have to have anything fancy. Plain vanilla ice cream, pour some Guinness in it. You'll yeah. be happy. Yeah, I've done that with whiskey, too, by the way. Mm -hmm. Like, bourbon works well in, <laughs> in ice cream. <laughs> yes, it sure does. <laughs> if you're like, you know what, this ice cream needs a little kick. Yeah. Um, we, we, We've got an ice cream with Ben and Jerry's out called That's Whiskey right. Biz. And, I remember, uh, I remember seeing oh, about I that. Seen that with some piggyback. I'm, yeah, oh, I yeah. bet. Whis um, whiskey Business is that what it's called? Yeah, uh, whiskey I love that. Yeah. That's, That's so amazing. good. That's very Ben and Jerry's. I Speaking like it. Speaking of whiskey, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking of whiskey, mm -hmm. so what oh, this we're, smells like almost like a vanilla ice cream. What we're sampling here is this was the first Whistle Pig ever. Correct. Was the ten year, and when this first came out, it was the only whistle pig that was that I was mean, available. Right? When I started, this is what I marched the streets with for years and years and years mm -hmm. until we came out with twelve year, which we'll we'll finish with today. And um, you know, these were rescued barrels from Alberta, Canada, that we brought to Vermont and and launched the company. I love and, how you say rescued barrels. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But really, this is just a. Uh, those barrels could have ended up in someone's backyard with a. They could have ended with up a piece of plywood at, on top right, of them. Right, right. Two to five percent of like into a, a, a Canadian club or a Crown Royal as structure and backbone, mm -hmm. and it would have been flavoring whiskey. Yeah, absolutely. So we just took it and said, you know what, we're going to put let's, an age statement on it, some rye, yeah, and do a hundred proof and go at it. Nice. This, um, this is like the classic. I'm going to go ahead. And, I'm going to go the OG. And give up yeah. my ghost yeah. on this one. I've had the twelve, and I like it. But this, to me, is the pinnacle of the brand right mm. now. This is so That's good. so interesting. This is so good and so delicious and so vanilla. And so and like I said, when I said it smells like vanilla ice cream, it really has that kind of creaminess Almost to it. Almost vanilla bean It has the spice it, it? that yeah. you expect from the rye, but it has this, this sweet creaminess to it that just makes it like this is such an outstanding... Uh, expression. So for a uh, for a spirit of this, you know, bigness, magnitude. It is just so easy to drink and that's yeah. the crazy thing about it. Like you yeah. would expect that this would be something like where it's like wow, you like where it's like kicking you every time. What is the it proof on this? Really one? Do that. 100. This is 100. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it doesn't really do that. Uh, it's 100 proof and it almost drinks as easily. I'm not saying it it doesn't have the 100 proof like feel to it, but almost drinks as easily as it's, a forty or fifty. It's so interesting too. One of the things I like about this one is, and I'm glad we tasted the other ones first because on the other ones, the uh, like if you were to split your palate three, three different like from front to middle to back, mm -hmm. I would say that the spice is towards the back of the palate on both of those. Kind of like where white pepper hits you, you know, back towards the back sure. of the jaw and, and kind of lingers a little bit. This one is dead center in the middle on the spice. Like, that spice mm -hmm. sits right in the center right of my tongue. Right in the very center of the palate, yep. And, and just sits there, and it just makes me want to drink more and more of this. Well, yeah. And that's the depth of the age of tenure, right? When you get the younger whiskeys, like the piggyback at six, or the blend of the straight rise with the three and six and ten, you're going to have that racy, you're going to have some of those wood sugars and those tannins right out of the gate. Right. You're going to get that rice spice that's going to be integrated in there. This has had time to mellow a little bit. Yeah. yeah. This is, you know, you get the length. This is a sip. This is, you know, obviously it's going to stand up in a cocktail like we've talked about with all of these whiskeys. But at the end of the day, this is um, this is the reason why there's all these other whiskeys on the table today. And almost no heat whatsoever. Like the heat is just like a, a gentle rolling hill of it, like right after you swallow. And it's just like whoosh. Kind of, right, it kind of kind of dissipates a little uh, bit. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, Doug, tell me about the culture at Whistle Pig going forward in the post um, Dave era. Is it obviously he was a wonderful ambassador 
<clears throat> for the product. <clears throat> but what about the sort of vision that he had that was so much about what what the company was made from and where it was headed? Who steps into that position, and how do you continue to take Whistle Pig to the next place? So innovation's been our 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 mo from day mm-hmm. one, right? Sure. We, we took flavoring whiskey and and created a, a luxury rye category. A luxury rye, yeah. Right. Um, we've gone on, and when we talk about twelve year next, we'll talk about how we were really the first to do uh, maturation with different casks, and now look at the liquor shelf and look at the whiskey. Yeah, it's aisle. everywhere. It's mm-hmm. everywhere. People it's are doing it. Yeah. And the Scots were doing this before us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, the grain to bottles with the farm stocks and the boss hogs being just, you know, something that we've never done before and always single barrel and finished. And so the, the dream continues and has always been, Dave used to always say, be the high pig at the trough. I am. Keep pushing the envelope. I am mm-hmm. a little remiss as, uh, was it 2019 when you got invited to the... Uh, the uh, the release of the the boss hog. Uh, I think it was. Yeah, it was I didn't get to go. I had to work. I still yeah. had to not tried it to this day. Yeah, the so samurai scientist. It's a wonderful tear. thing. I, I see. I see the tear forming on your tear. cheek. Actually, uh, I, I wanted to point out something real quick. By the way, uh, as this is something I do once in a while, I did go back to this pecan, uh, Tejano mm-hmm. pecano, and, and how did the how was it going pig back? Makes it a good beer. Oh, you are right. Like the whistle pig adds what this beer needs. Right, it's a perfect combination. It's it's it very gives it a little odd. heft. Yeah, you know, it really it, it, really it brings more sweetness out. Yes, yes, it has so much vanilla lingering in it mm-hmm. that this this beer kind of. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out because that was fun. That's good. One of the things we love to do is going back and forth between the spirits of the beers. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. <laughs> no, we've but, had some, uh, we've had we've had some, some pretty wild not, combos. Yeah, do not go well uh, together. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you guys are working on something that is not a rye. Is there? Uh, is it something you can talk about? It is. Um, well, we first and foremost um, have a bonded product coming out. Oh, um, the first okay. barrel, first barrel of Beyond Bonded, right, is actually going to be raffled off at Meekum in Indianapolis on Saturday. Oh, so wow. it's barrel zero zero one of our own rye, just like what we talked about in farm stock. Mm-hmm. Our own rye from our farm, our own, you know, obviously done on the still, um, and also uh, aged in number three char oak, Vermont oak, right? Mm-hmm. And then like all of our whiskeys, proof down with our water, mm-hmm. but four years minimum aged, hundred percent rye from our farm, right? Right, and hundred proof. So well, and it's going to be the, the raffled first off. barrel will be raffled for off. first barrel of the rye, right? There will be one that um, is corn based, and we know what and that this one is, is called right? beyond beyond bonded, beyond bonded. Because not only are we going uh, as far as we've gone, these are single barrels of bonded. So that's why it's beyond beyond, right? And then we will be able to have up to forty talking points of each individual barrel of where the rye was on our farm, what the soil type was, how much <laughs> rainfall, we tracked everything. So are all the uh, all the different um, expressions we've had today, we've had three of them so far, are mm-hmm. they all different rye bills on there, or different mash bills uh, on there, or are they all coming from the same distillate? Um, 100% rye, three different sources, 100% rye. Um, I say always a weighted average of 97 because we have some 95, 97, and 100% rye. It's a blend 10-year that we're drinking is 50 different barrels okay. to make that flavor so profile. 50, yeah, to, right. to average right. the profile to what you're so looking for. So some that right. are going to have that mm-hmm. you know huge caramel structure and some that are going to have more of that wood tannin and some that are maybe going to be very balanced and maybe not for single barrel selections. I'm fascinated by the blending process, taking all those ingredients and coming out with something that is average the same palette every single to, time. To be able That's to remain consistent with it. Yes, it really is. It's 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 where the art meets science, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. It, it's a lot of fun. It's a so, lot of fun. So what else uh, beyond that? Do you have other other products you're looking at beyond that, or is this as far as it goes now? We, we, we do. We, we have some other stuff coming out later this year, but I'd get uh, slapped on the hand if I spoke Und- too much understood. about it. That's why I always said. Where we try to there are other things. Yes, I know what you're yeah. doing. <laughs> yeah. No, um, but keep, keep your eyes peeled and... Um, 
be on the lookout for things that are, once again, looking outside the rye box. See, what I love okay. about this conversation right here is it's okay if he doesn't tell us what's happening. Because that's a great excuse for him to come back. Yes, it as is. As soon as it does happen. As soon as it sure. does happen, yeah. If you want, we could even do... I used to do this thing back when I did radio morning shows where <clears throat> I would get information about like the sp a spoiler information for like a big finale of like some show like the sopranos or something like that that was doing its finale episode so i would tell people that if they wanted to hear the spoiler that we would put it only in the left channel and in the right channel we'd play like a tiny tim song or something like so that you could just pin and, your stereo right, one and way and of course most people tried to hear both right just because it was more fun and interesting that way of course the thing i didn't tell them is that my spoiler information was completely made up. <laughs> so <laughs> you didn't know that he just walked out of the diner and that right, was the end right, of the show. Yeah, right. Come how, on. How could I have guessed how that? How could right? you have guessed how that? How could I have guessed that? It was so, all just a dream. <laughs> if I had said it, "Journey, don't stop believing," we'll be playing. You, no one would have believed that. You know, every time I hear that song, I still think of that. Yeah, I know. It's, every it's time. that. It's that thing. I know. It, there's so many arguments as to whether it was good or was not good, but. But yeah, it was iconic. It, it doesn't matter. It was iconic. We, we for remember sure. it, right? Yep, that's exactly right. And we're right. talking about it. Wait, so. I never watched it. That's what happens. Well, <sighs> there's a journey song involved. We ruined yes. it. I should have played Tiny Tim in the right channel when we were talking about it. That's what I should have done. You've been all home right. for over a year, and you haven't watched all the Sopranos? All right. Okay, so we're going to take a break. We still haven't talked about Close But No Cigar, but we got to do drinking news coming up in the next segment. And, of course, there's this— I, I don't uh, know that people really enjoy drinking news. You don't think so? <laughs> <laughs> That's the one I hear the most. Uh, Is that what feedback? you hear the most yeah, about? Yeah, big yeah. Time. Well, it see, see, it seems to me that the great thing about drinking news is that if you're doing what we say and following through that these stories are best enjoyed when you are drinking, I think it puts you in a mindset to maybe be more receptive and, yes. and, and find the whole experience more enjoyable. Drinking news is a segment we do on the show where uh, we pass along a story that we at least believe to be true. We've seen it in print somewhere and not The Onion, right? And, and it's, uh, it's something we believe to be true that may or may not be about drinking, but it's probably always best enjoyed, consumed, if you've been <laughs> drinking. And that's what we'll open our next segment with, plus a little thing called Whistle Pig 12 Year is in our future. Oh, oh that's exciting. We'll be right back. It's Smoking the Toast. Welcome back. It is smoking and toasting. It's the uh, program that's all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand rolled cigars. Show number two hundred and thirty three. And forty three hundred. We are brought to you by mycigarshirts dot com. Great shirts for cigar lovers on the web. Please go check them out. Mycigarshirts dot com because cigars. Yes, absolutely. I was uh, I was noticing something. You know, um, Doug from Whistle Pig is here, and he's a great guest. But he does this thing where he like has a tendency to pour the next whistle pig during during the break between segments, and then he sets it here, and then we're gonna do like drinking news or something, and it's just sitting there like it's taunting, calling to me it's before the uh, yes. be before it before it's time. So I'll just uh, mm. oh oh oh, I'll just say one word: vanilla. What's funny is mine is way over here, and it's taunting you, too. Yeah, it is. It is. In fact, uh, these <laughs> bottles have been sitting here taunting me for pretty much the entire show. But be that as it may, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for Drinking News. Drinking News. Drinking News. Now it's time for Drinking News. Drinking News. Drinking News. Now it's time for Drinking News. A Florida man with one arm said he had a gator for a pet. When I asked about his absent arm, he said, uh... I had to take my gator to the vet. Drinking news, drinking news. Now it's time for drinking news. Cheers, y'all. Drinking news today uh, deals with a solution that could have helped. You know, uh, we're often... You know, we try not to get too political here on the show, but we're not afraid to be critical of government for, like, you know, just being too... You know, too big and wheelie. I wish they'd tax cigars yeah, more. Right, exactly. Doing stuff like that and sometimes failing to find cheap and obvious solutions to things. And today's story is a, well, you, a We're talking bit about, about a government that buys, you know, $265 hammers. Exactly. This is exactly what we're talking about. Sometimes they get they get stuck on ideas that, that 
missed something obvious, and they may have in this particular case from today's drinking news. During former President Trump's first campaign, he promised, if elected, to build a wall along the U.S. and Mexico border. But despite his efforts, this expensive project was never finished. And while we don't want to get into whether the wall was a good idea or a bad one, Smokin' and Toastin' will point out that perhaps Mr. Trump could have gotten further on the wall if he'd followed the example of a farmer from the small Michigan township of Lodi. Oh, Lord. According to Fox 2 Stuck Detroit. Stuck Lodi again. <laughs> I think that was Lodi, California, but it, yeah, it's, it, was, it, it but... works, yeah. <laughs> According to Fox 2 Detroit, Mr. Wayne Lambarth and the owner of a neighboring farm have been having a property line dispute for quite some time. Nothing's juicier than a good property line dispute story. Mm -hmm. The neighboring farmer, who is not actually named in the report, apparently took matters into his own hands to try and settle the issue by building very quickly, inexpensively, and totally on his own, a 250-foot wall between their properties. Huh? The wall... Hundred and that's, dude. You know how many toes that is. The wall is made out of poop. <laughs> <laughs> the unusual divider now separates the two properties inside the Washtenaw County, Michigan area. And according to Mr. Lambarth, <laughs> I love this. It's not only a physical divider, but it also comes with a powerful stench. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Can you imagine when it rains? Can you even imagine when it rains? Uh, the anonymous farmer who built the wall actually denies that it is the, in fact the anonymous farmer. The anon yeah, he's, he refused to be named in the uh, news story. Uh, he actually denies that it is in fact made from dung and describes it as a compost fence. As you probably mm -hmm. know, compost, compost can be a little fence. smelly as well. You know, I knew um, a guy who was, uh, he used to pump gas and he called himself a petroleum transfer engineer. <laughs> that's which, exactly right. So there you, you know, go. There you go. <laughs> it's all in the name. That's what right? I'm talking about, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll call him uh, Farmer Poo Poo Head because yeah. it's my, my my nephew Vincent's. I have to do one shout out in it. He's, it's eight birthday and he calls people poo, poo head so that's farmer poo, -poo farmer, head. Poo, -poo, farmer head. poo poo head it totally head. works he's um, kind of a crappy neighbor well farmer poo poo head <laughs> oh I, that was a that was a joke grenade that one took a second where's the like rim that. shot you needed the rim yeah. shot on that yeah oh, it, it, it circled for a minute there uh, it really did finally when it came in for a landing though it was pretty ugly uh the uh anonymous farmer poo poo head uh, who built the wall actually denies that it's from dung. He says it's a compost fence. Whichever is true, the hey, material. Wait a second, isn't compost dung? Yeah, trash. Well, it's yeah, yeah. Compost it's is de oh, and trash, compost good. is decomposing mm. stuff. So it's poop right? with a couple with right. a couple so, grocery bags. Anything that can naturally right. decompose. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Which poop would fit right in? There. I think so. Mm -hmm. One would mm -hmm. hope. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, whether uh, whether whichever uh, description is more accurate, the materials for the wall were obviously quite inexpensive. And perhaps Mr. Trump could have learned how to build one of his own by watching the video tutorial which you can find on doityourself.com. I would like to point out that the compost fence, yeah. uh, this is this is not going out to Farmer Poo Poo Head, this is going out to his neighbor. Uh, compost fence is probably somewhat flammable. Oh, that could be. That's a good point. That's a very good point. And yeah. if I know anything about compost piles, sometimes they set themselves on fire. On fire. <laughs> Spontaneous compost combustion. They do because uh, they they decompose and it creates heat. They're giving and off the methane down and under but, yeah. the sun, they'll start to smolder and smoke. Well, Michigan. you got to mix the compost, you know, <laughs> with the yeah matter. Michigan <laughs> officials say there's really nothing they can do about the poop wall since it sits on private property. Uh, there has been no comment from the office of the former president, and that is your drinking news. Drinking news, drinking news. That was time for drinking news. Drinking news, drinking news. This was time for drinking news. Cheers, y'all. You know, I love when we have a guest from a really well respected, important company like uh, Whistle Pig. And we get done with drinking news, and I always steal a glance over to see if they're sitting there looking like, why have I wasted my time? <laughs> 
I'm just so excited. Right. I got to plug my, my, my nephew's, you know, birthday that I'm and, um, in Houston and, 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 and here for. So and you got we're to say poo head. I got to say poo head for yeah. him. So that, uh, Love you, buddy. That's a wonderful thing. <laughs> All right, Ian, I see you have already gone to the, um, to the whiskey. This is the 12-year. Talk to me. Uh, the 12 years nice. Yeah. Uh, it's... I kind of thought it would be, but... Yeah, so it it has... It has a, uh, a beautiful richness to it. It's a lot more delicate than mm-hmm. the 10. Like, tons more delicate than the 10. It's actually almost so delicate that it's a little startling. Um, like, scotch-style delicate mm-hmm. in, the, in the flavors. Um, it is very vanilla. It is very... Um, M- uh, rye, spice, and sweet. It's a lot of things. Wow, it's it, a lot of things, and all of those things so, are awesome. They are very good. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, I'm also going to maintain, as much as I like this, that 10 is still well, my you, favorite out you of the said, batch. You said, I think, the right word. The difference to me between the 12 and the 10 is that the 12 is more delicate. It's got just, it's a little more subtle, and that makes sense. It's two years more aged. It's uh, it's had time to rest more and let the flavors mellow a little more. And it's got a certain center to it that is, uh, I don't know, creamier, uh, a little less uh, maybe robust than, than the 10-year. It's interesting. Uh, with the age statement, the spice moves even a half step forward in the palate as mm-hmm. well. And then it has a little more as as like after you swallow it, it it's not it's not a, a very alcohol forward right it, as far as you know liquor goes. But that heat comes up pretty fast after it as is well. Is this also one hundred proof? The whiskey hug. No, this is eighty six proof. It's eighty six, but proof, it is one hundred percent rye. Okay, come. Okay. It it feels like it has a little more heat. But in a good whiskey hug kind of way. Mm-hmm. Well, do, it's, do you happen to have an opener over there, sir? You know, I was going to mention. I don't think I do. I think You're we nice. gave uh, one to uh, to Rowdy the other day. No, please. Uh, and and we. Oh no! <laughs> Not with that knife. Okay. No. <laughs> I, I like uh, a man with rules with the on. knife. No, yeah. no. Not when your knife is like over hundreds of dollars. Yep. yep. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna not <laughs> crank it open let me, with let that. Me check this out and see if I've still got one here, but. I think I gave it away last week. My wife, however, says this knife looks like a parrot. Yeah, it I does. Know. I was looking at it. Yeah. I don't so. have it. Uh, Adam, would you mind running and getting one? I'm sorry. I was I was unprepared. No, if, if I had a different knife <laughs> with the way, me, yes, then then we could crack it open. With by the way, Doug, it. make sure that uh, I get your uh, address at the end of this so I can send you your smoking and toasting bottle opener. Because normally Thank if we you. have a bottle, we open it up and then we I have one in let the, the car. Let the guest take we, uh, the... Uh, Bottle opener home with them because it's quite the cool. It's one of those long, you know, bartender cool uh, oh, yeah. bottle openers. Not one of the little cheapy Premium ones. Premium yeah. Russian. Yes, this is from Gigantic Imperial Brewing Stop. in Portland. The, the the bottle has a, a locust. Yeah, some would call it a grasshopper. Or a cicada. These or cicadas are all cicadas, the rage now. I mean, it's, it's, it's the 17 it's almost, year cicada in, in infiltration. It's almost Man. cicada season. They get mm-hmm. so loud. Like yeah. it is crazy. And by the way, did you know that the uh, the sound that the um, the thing? You remember the original the thing the uh, uh, the one with uh, oh the John Carpenter movie, not yes. not the Fantastic Four, the but the John Carpenter movie. The sound that the thing makes when they finally show it, like yeah. in the scene with the dog and everything, that, mm-hmm. that actually is Texas cicadas. Mm-hmm. That's the sound that they use for that. That's pretty awesome. That Why sense. do I know that? I don't know. <laughs> Why do we laugh Why at drinking matter? news? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's it's just one of those things. While you pour that, Ian, let me let me follow through on this. Close but no cigar. I found this great um, uh, web article that explains the origin of certain sayings. For example, you, you've heard of the saying about giving someone the cold shoulder. Uh huh. That originated in the early 1800s. Uh, and it had something to do with serving a meal to your guest. If guests overstayed their welcome, you'd serve them a cold shoulder of meat, in the, inf- the inferior and tougher part of the uh, of the cut. And once they got the cold shoulder, they would take the hint and leave. And that's where that you know you always thought it was like maybe like the physical act of turning away and right, and offering right. your shoulder. But that the term blockbuster originated from a type of World War II bomb that the Royal Air Force used. The Germans started calling it the blockbuster because the bomb could reduce a single city block to rubble. 
So therefore, the uh, name Blockbuster crazy. literally busts the block. Uh, then it came to mean anything uh, big and exciting. The phrase, and this is a good one for us, paint the town red. You've heard that, uh-huh, right? I have. Back in 1837, English prankster George Bursford and his friends were carousing in the town of Melton Mowbray. George found some red paint and literally painted the town red. The toll gate, the statues, many of the town's front doors. He had enough cash to pay back any damage costs, but what he did became shorthand for having a wild night out. (laughs) So it was based on a real, true thing. But the reason we share this with you is we have now the origin of the phrase, close but no cigar. I've heard people say that before. but no cigar. It comes from traveling fairs and carnivals in the 1800s. The prizes back then... And they should totally revert to this, by the way. We're not <laughs> giant stuffed teddy bears. Oh, to hell with a stuffed teddy bear. I can get a cigar? They were cigars or bottles of whiskey. Man, you know, okay, so... Uh, I'm in. When I was a kid, um, I went to uh, a theme park. And I remember, like, being jealous when you see someone with the big prize and you're like, that's so awesome, I wish I could get one of those. And I had one, I, I went up to one of those booths and I don't remember if I was throwing it into a, a bouncy yeah, right. ball. One of the bouncy I don't remember ring what things, the game yeah. was. But I won this giant parrot. <laughs> and I was so happy. Why is that funny? I mean, the That's thing was, the, I, I was like nine or ten years old. The thing was almost my size. I was probably 11, actually, now that I think about it. The thing was almost my size, okay? And I was like, yeah, look what I won. I won, like, the best prize they had. And then I had to carry that son of a bitch around all <laughs> it's so true. day. It's so long. true. Yeah, absolutely. I hated that uh, parrot by the end of the day. It's well, still at my mom's still house. Still can't all listen to Jimmy Buffett. All my nieces and nephews love it. See, if, man, been, if you'd have won thing. a cigar, you could have just slipped it into your pocket and smoked it later. That's exactly right. right. Like that's the best thing. Yeah. Well, back when the prizes were cigars or a bottle of whiskey, if you missed the prize at the carnival game, if you you know. Almost made the basket or almost got the ring across the bottle. I get uh, it. The carny would shout, close, but, but no, no cigar. cigar. And that's I where it actually love came from. That. So that's a, uh, that's, a, that's a look inside how and why things happen and where statements and thoughts came from. By the way, I just have to say, this 12 year is one of those things that it, and you could say this about a lot of spirits, of course, but. But I'm talking about just taking tiny sips of this. It really gets. But the fourth and fifth sip are better than the first and second. Mm-hmm. It just, it just really grows on your palate, and it's Man. not just Wait because I've had twenty seventh. Oh. <laughs> it's I pretty look, amazing. Man. I look forward to that time uh, with with great anticipation. Uh, no, seriously, it's one of those things that it just gets better and better as you go. It does. Like a like a great uh, uh, like a great entree. Or, or a great bottle of wine. You ever have that like great bottle of wine that those first couple of drinks are good, but then like when you get to about the halfway point on the bottle, you're like, this wine is amazing. Most wines that you're describing, the last glass should be the best. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it uh, should be. It should. I, I will tell you that I intend to find out if the same thing is true for the 12 year. Well, that's fine. It's not <laughs> a problem. Is the bottom of the bottle better than the top? You mentioned. I don't uh, know. You mentioned that the 12 year had a, a bit of special significance for you in your uh, journey with uh, with Whistlepig. Yeah, you know, um, like I said, 10 years what brought us to the dance. 12 year, um, you know, Dave, when he left Makers and, and we started Whistlepig and he started really kind of being a consultant for bringing the rye category back. I mean, he was really the Johnny Appleseed of rye. But more importantly, he was... Um, he was somebody who was always pushing the envelope, always looking at the innovation piece. And he was not only innovating rye, uh, uh, re-innovating rye, so mm-hmm. to speak, but he would just go consult for tons of people mm-hmm. to do what he was doing. On a well. handshake. Like, right. On, how like, amazing like Blacken, is that? for example. Right? I yeah. make this great product, and I'm going to tell you how to do it, too. Yep. Yeah, That's which amazing. is which almost seems counterintuitive as no, a business. No, but it's move. a beautiful thing. But it's a beautiful. I just want to point thing. that out about this yep. guy. He's, Absolutely, he's pretty amazing. And and so the Scots and other people have been doing maturations and different finishing casks and whatnot for for ages, right? Hundreds of years. But no one in America was he was doing that yet, right? And um, 
this was a three-year project. It was one year to get all these uh, different casts for him to play with, one year to play with the different casks, and I've got a lot of gray in my beard from being the person that was running the Tales of the Cocktail in New Orleans. For those of you watching year. videos, he's only 26 years old. 26. <laughs> Anyways. Man, I wish. Uh, actually, I don't. Yeah, um, yeah. I would only we're wanna, good. We're good. I would only want to be 26 if I could take my knowledge with me that I've learned, <laughs> so that I wouldn't oh. redo all that stupid shit that I did when I was 26. But Cruz, you're you're a better person because you did all that stupid stuff. Man, let's let's hope that's true. I'm just gonna stick with that. Let's hope that's that's what my wife says. That's you know? good. That's, that's good. What my wife I stand says. by she your says, wife. You know, She's a good sometimes person. I say, you know, God, I, I just just. You know, wish I hadn't made, you know, all those mistakes because you wouldn't even know they were mistakes if we hadn't made them. I was like, well, that's probably true. I didn't know there were mistakes when I made them. So there you go. You yeah. Know? And and so Dave would be sitting there till wee hours of the morning by the pool while, uh, you know, bartenders are diving for bottles of Boss Hog at the bottom. Um, hopefully our, <laughs> our, our law team's not listening to this. But um, it was years ago. Don't worry. Um, at the Statute end of the day, has the, uh, exactly, it's, it's completely expired. This the, is in theory. This thing happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's a story I make up. I'm a storyteller. So it, it was a year to figure out which three really played the best together, and a year for him to come up with the blend. And now you look at the shelf and you see all the different maturations and different companies playing around with different casks and finishes. Sauterne, we were the first to, to to do that. We were the first to really play with Madeira. As well, really? um, well, wow. Jefferson loved Madeira, and he hung out with this guy named Washington, who was the number one distiller of rye in his day. I've heard those and, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of them. Um, and and so we, we were pretty sure that you know he had finished some rye and Madeira casks at Washington's distillery. But you know, so we'll say we're second from reading a, okay. a, a history book. And Port's been played around with a little bit more, but still to this day, no one's marrying three finishes together. And this is an homage to Dave's um, just foresight, intuition, always pushing the envelope, always looking at innovation. And I feel like um, this is the one that will live on in infamy that Dave had touched all of us and given us this gift, not only of rye and age statement rye and something that is so uh, hard to distill. It's the hardest grain to distill. And he had never done it before. And, and, and then to push it as far in innovation to do this, when I got the phone call from our CEO to um, tell me of, of Dave's passing, this is the bottle I grabbed, and mm -hmm. this is what I was uh, I was I was drinking when my wife walked in and said, "Why are you listening to blues records by yourself in the kitchen?" and uh, and drinking twelve year and drinking twelve year <laughs> and trying to find the bottom of it, which I did, yeah. and she helped me. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a, a special. It's elegant. It's soft. It is. It's feminine. Um, Fifteen year is you know robust and big and. Um, I call it situational whiskey because I want to be with a cigar or near a fire. Man, you can drink 12-year before, during, after dinner. When we're doing pairing dinners, people are always like, where should we put 12-year? I was like, where do you want to put it? Anywhere. Anywhere. I think he added a phrase. You know, I, I never will, of course, have an autobiography. But I have fun choosing a title for mine. every, And I change it like every month or two. So my new title for my autobiography. Autobiography? Is it hold my beer? No, it oh. used to, I've, but I've uh, I've had that one before. But now it's going to be situational whiskey. <laughs> that's a great that's a great title. That's yeah, good. Situational right? whiskey. I yeah. like that. Yeah, I like that. Well, uh, this is it, I, I love the twelve year. It's just to me, it's just almost like the ultimate expression of what you guys do and what yeah. uh, uh, what Dave was 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 creating all this time. And uh, it's it's just to me, it's so mellow and so gentle if, if i can use that phrase mm -hmm. for a whiskey mm -hmm. and I, I just love that it's just uh it's not beating me over the head it's taking the journey with me right and i love that the uh the bottle that i had at my house uh my wife really liked it mm -hmm. and i know this because i got to bring it on the show we had a few drinks of it mm -hmm. and then when i took it home it was gone it uh <laughs> it, it went down pretty quickly and before yeah. and, and by the time i was like you know what i really want to want a glass of that um, mm. Oh man! man. <laughs> hey, baby, where's that? Uh, <laughs> so, in we have uh, each sipped, but not talked at all about this gigantic uh, imperial uh, stout. It is the most premium. I have not Russian imperial stout. I was busy with whistle. Aged in Scotch barrels. Oh, so you haven't tasted this? <laughs> no, yet. No, I haven't. Okay, so this I'm just going to put it to my nose, and I'm just going to talk a little this bit. Answers about, my question about I'm going to talk about dates. About mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about 
Definitely raisin and date. Mm-hmm. I'm going to talk about a little coffee. On the nose, it almost has a barley wine vibe to it. It very because much. You can, mm-hmm. you can get the sort of booziness. You can smell how sweet and you can it get is. The like, date and raisin feel. Yes. But you can also smell that kind of like like bitter coffee finish that right. it's going to have. And right that's going to come bed. through when you taste it, I think. And that'll be what steers it sort of away from the barley wine vibe and towards that Russian Imperial Stout. Oh. Is the coffee. The malt in this is like a roasted, like, hit you over the head with it at the beginning of the palate malt that mm-hmm. is just... But it's very well integrated, too. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I, I love how it follows, and it finishes with with uh, with very, very dark fruit date or yeah. fig or... Or, um, like, or what, are those, sweet. what are those red fruits? I don't know what they are, but you, you find them most commonly in fruitcake? I don't know what they are. It's like a... Is it a currant? What is that? No, because the current's blue, right? Uh, there's different colors. Yeah. I, I don't know, but I don't know. It's delicious. It's fabulous. Whatever it is, it's fabulous. Dried cherries, maybe? Maybe dried cherries. Dried that cherry. might be what mm-hmm. it is. That, that yeah, seems well, like they a have very a little simple bit of, answer. The dried to cherries have that bitterness to it. They have that, uh-huh. that tart. And there's snap just a little it. touch of that in here, I think. Um, Ru- it, that rhubarb, it, I get a little. Rhubarb, yeah. I can kind of go with that. The mm. sweetness. The right? red part of the rhubarb, mm-hmm. not, yeah. not the green part. So, Ian, I got this beer actually in a three-pack. It's all gigantic um, Russian Imperial Stout, most premium. But the barrel aging has been different for each one. This oh. one this one was aged in uh, scotch barrels. I have another one. It's, have it not says opened right it yet. here on the bottle, according to Surgeon General, women should Thank not Thank you drink for it. reading that, yeah. <laughs> Let me let me turn the bottle around. Okay, thank you. It says we age most uh, premium Russian Imperial Stout in a variety of barrels: Scotch, rye, rum, and port. The sticker on the crown identifies which barrel this beer was aged in. It's a uh... oh, Scotch twenty one. Right, That's Scotch twenty one. And twenty one is the year. Is the year mm-hmm. right? Not the uh, not the age of the gotcha. Scotch barrels. Uh, so we have this, and on future shows we'll be able to sample the rye, and I believe the other one is the rum. Excellent. So I'm looking forward to all of that. I'm so totally this is, for it. This is good. You like this, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is right up your alley. I no, think. this is this is like if if I'm sitting around having a beer later in the evening, I would drink like and this is the right size bottle too. This is a uh, this just, is a pint. Yeah, just slightly a larger pint than your point nine. bottle. Yeah. Uh so sixteen point nine for those of you. Um and this would be one like to finish the evening with. Mm-hmm. That would be Pretty fantastic. Just big enough that you can open it and share it if you've got a friend over. Absolutely, but not too big to handle on your own right. if you're uh, if you're solo. Right. Right. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I like the way they do these things. I love that breweries are getting involved in experimenting with what their um, with what their brews are like in so many different kinds of casks and and barrels and storing them for different lengths of time and coming up with things that that are just there's so much fun to experiment with absolutely you know it's you know and it's funny because uh you're talking about um dave starting the whole finishing the rye in different barrels and, and really pioneering that with beer it was uh it was the uh, Goose Island. Yeah, it, it really that was started no. that. And both of us have read that book, and we've actually had the author of the book uh, on the show. It's Bourbon called Bourbon Barrel Stout, Bourbon Barrel Stout and, Stout selling, and out. selling Out. Yeah, it's about Great Goose book. Island. Have you read it's, that? It's mm-hmm. wonderful. Absolutely fantastic. Highly yeah. recommended, and it is. Uh, it's all about how Goose Island Brewery in mm-hmm. Chicago yep. became the first to really experiment with uh, retinomyces and with the uh, the whole aging mm-hmm. concept. And of course, it's everywhere now. But it was not that long ago that nobody did that, and people thought they were crazy. That's 20 years, yeah. I think. And then, of course, it also tells 20, years. the story of them ultimately selling the brewery to Anheuser Bush and what what all that meant. But uh, but yeah, one of the one of the poignant parts of that is when he talks about being at a meeting at Budweiser with a lot of yes. the Budweiser brewers, yes, yeah. and how they treated him as if he wasn't a real brewer, right? Because 
they were Budweiser brewers, right? And yeah. That's real beer. Right. Yeah, that's what they, that's what they think. Well, yeah. I told you about the movie I saw with the the competition between all of the Budweiser brewmasters, and it's not about who can make the best beer. It's an internal company competition. It's not about who can make the best beer or come up with the greatest new recipe. It's about who can make the most consistently Budweiser-y Budweiser that you can possibly do. So that's how big beer looks at I things. Know what to say and I understand that. the need for consistency. I'm I'm mind blown that your distillers can come up with a 10 year or a 12 year year after year that maintains the consistency of this. But to me, I wouldn't even care if it was a little different. What I care about is how good it is. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, you and, know? and you know what? Having a little difference, That's I love single barrel selections because right. having that a very little reason. difference from from uh, expression to expression, or even with the same distillate, just the differences in, 100%. oh, it was in this barrel, it was in this barrel. And there's there's a whole like mind-blowing thing about how you can take all these barrels that you have, and they're all going to taste a little different. And then blend them into something that's very consistent. And that's an amazing talent. And that is the trend in craft beer right now. However, way, is short I runs, love, experimentation. Yeah, I love all those different mm. like single barrel Makes things. it a good time to be doing this, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> it really does. All right, speaking of that, we're going to wrap up the show in the next segment. So we'll be right back to say thank you and uh, offer our sort of final thoughts on the whistle pig that we've tasted uh, and uh, and give our huge uh, thanks to Doug for being here. So that will be uh, uh, just our wrap-up of the show coming up. It's Smoking and Toasting show number 233, Whistle Pig in the studio. Woo. All right, I hate you, but I got Okay, we got one. <laughs> I'll try a little more of the 12, please. Yes, sir. Welcome back. It's Smoking and Toasting. This is the program for radio, podcasts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that is all about uh, craft beer, fine spirits, which we are enjoying today, and hand rolled cigars with Whistle Pig in the studio and Doug Ward, who is the uh, Whistle Pig National Brand Ambassador. Obviously, big shoes to step into from the late Dave Pickerel, but seeing as the, you know, he's somebody that you have such respect and and uh, and admiration for. I, I think it, I think it was a perfect choice. Like you're the perfect guy to follow him because you didn't want the next Dave to be Dave 2.0. There'll you know? never be another Dave. Right. Exactly. It was, and and so it'd be crazy to to try to do that. And so I I like the fact that they've uh, uh, that you guys have you know gone this direction. You're here. You're a great ambassador for the product. But we were talking in between the segment. You mentioned you've got a connection to uh, one of our absolute favorite breweries in the world, not just in our city, uh, which is St. Arnold and uh, and Aaron, who we had on the show a couple of weeks ago. So tell us about that. So Aaron is a close, dear friend. Uh, he was at my wedding. Obviously, Lawnmower and Raspberry AF were served at my wedding, which is uh, <laughs> a, a fun story. So I'll uh, tell you a quick story. When Ian and I first got to know each other was right before he got married. Mm -hmm. And I went to his wedding, uh, he and his lovely bride, Tiffany, and I remember standing at the keg, looking around, and I said to my wife, uh, who I think then was I, just my fiance. I, I've known his wife for many, many years. Yeah. We, we I said, years ago. okay, of all the weddings I've been to, this one has the best beer of any wedding it ever. Makes a difference. And, and Ian had uh, gotten a gotten a buddy at a, a local craft brewery to mm -hmm. uh, uh, to supply, and I was like, this is great. You know, you're used to just you know. Coors Light or whatever. So we did not so, have Coors Light. But if you had Raspberry AF and uh, Lawnmower at your at your wedding, that it, sounds like a jam. It was very important to find a venue in New Orleans that was going to allow me to walk my own booze in mm. because I'm not paying. Yeah, for every bottle right. through right. a caterer. Right, right, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But um, to 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 give you the full story, the first time I met Aaron was in Houston, obviously, and we were at a uh, whiskey event. Um, but it was it was you know it had it encompassed beer and and whiskey and, mm -hmm. and whatnot, and I'm setting up a table right with a, with a buddy who's a bartender here in town, um, and I have my back turned and some guy walks over to my table, and slams both his fists down, and goes I need your barrels, <laughs> and I'm like, who are you? <laughs> and he says my name's Aaron Inkrot and I work for St Arnold and I'm the head brewmaster. And I said, I've had your beer. Sounds good. I don't we don't sell barrels to breweries, man. This was so long ago. So yeah, right? I was in, when would this be? Like uh, early two thousands? No, you know? no, no, no. We started in twenty ten. So this would okay. have been like fourteen. 
Okay. Right? So yeah. this was, uh, you know, seven years ago or something like that. And, uh, and I was like, well, we can look into it. And um, I remember him being like, really like a bottle, and I can get you some uh, bishops. And I was like, okay. So I give him a bottle of tenure, right? Yeah. And he walks over with six bottles of beer. And I'm like, what are we doing here? <laughs> you, you, You've but, given him a bottle of six I've of him a, a bottle He's of bringing tenure. you a six pack. I give you an $80 bottle of, of rye, and you're giving me a six pack of beer. And then he explained it, and I was like, oh. Yeah. Like, he they, gave me. They sell for about $10 a piece. Too. 10, 3, or, you know, 2, 3, 4, 5. Like, he gave me a. Oh, he gave like, you a. Like a, a mixed K, uh, you know, mixed wow. six pack. And I was like, all right, all right. And it was kind of off to the races from there, and we've been friends ever since. And, and you guys uh, have supplied barrels for them. Yes, you know? yeah. yeah. There's been nu- numerous ones. When you said uh, barley wine out of the gate with this, uh, that was one of the first ones that they did. Yes, right? and I love – so barley – I have a funny story about the first one that they did as well. Yep. Um, my brew club, uh, one of our members worked at St. Arnold's at that point in time. His name was Vince Mandeville. And, um, and he brought a keg. Of what I think was the first uh, bishop's barrel, nice, mm. and it was one of the little round a keg. Uh, yeah, it was a little five gallon. Clearly, round though, keg. he worked there because you wouldn't have access right, to right. that. Yeah. yeah, and it wasn't a slim. It's not like the kind you put there, but it was a round keg that was sitting in a rack so that it was gravity. Yep. You know the entire thing, and nobody drank it the entire night. <laughs> Oh, Everyone dude. was like, this is too much. Because it was brutal. It was big and it was huge. And I absolutely loved it. And I drank it all night long. <laughs> tipsy. The next morning, we're cleaning up the party. And everyone's like, well, does anyone have room to put that in their car? I was like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then they were like, then they were like, uh, well, but do you have, like, space to keep it at your house? I was like, I got a whole fridge. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> I got a whole refrigerator. So you wound up with a I drank mini that keg, keg of uh, of the original. I drank that one. keg for a month and a <clears> half. <throat> oh, dude! And I was, and and I invited people over to try it, and everyone was like, "Oh, this is just too much for me," because it was just dark, sticky. I mean, it came out like glop glop, like oil almost. <laughs> it was beautiful. I absolutely loved it. <laughs> and uh, and I drank that thing for like almost two months, and when finally I went over there one day. And poured myself a cup, and I got to my nose, and I was like, oh, it's turning. Oh, yes. Because oxygen, you know. Yeah, so yeah. I was like, oh, it's turning. And I was like, oh. And then I lifted the keg out because I was going to, you know, empty it and bring it back. Um, so I lifted the keg up, but there was, like, almost nothing in it. So I probably only wasted about three or yeah. four pints out of the entire <laughs> That's thing. not bad. I drank that bad. son of a bitch by myself. Well. At Good least work. you got it done. At least you got and it I done. And I loved it the whole time, and no one else liked it. There was no carbonation. There was yeah. nothing. It was yeah. just ridiculous, dark uh, But But tastes syrup. have changed. People have come around to that yeah. now. There's, you'll find much more people who are interested in that kind of uh, beer consistency and flavor and taste. And look, so even... This I'll, 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 is similar. I'll admit, mm-hmm. I had not really had... Like any serious time tasting barley wines until we did that on this show, yeah. and I've come to love them. But it, it, you know, at first it was like, okay, I get it, but I don't know if this is something I would drink at home. And now I, it's like, bring it on. I found yeah. barley yeah. wines kind of early on in my tasting, and uh, and just got to loving them. And there's been so many good ones over the years, but just not not many people do them. Well, yeah. your it's, palate changes every seven years. It doesn't send you an email. <laughs> I've heard that about your allergies too. That your allergies change every seven. Yeah, years. they evolve. Your allergies. Yeah. They should your palate, get better right? instead of worse. Can I send them an email back? Please do. Yeah, mm-hmm. please do. Well, As your mom wishes they would because you know she's like you used to love peas when you were a kid and. You well, don't love them anymore. As right? far as as far as palate though, that's totally true. I would say yeah. that seven years ago, some of the IPA flavors that I really enjoy now would not have been my favorite IPAs. Right. You know and. I didn't used to even like the first time I tried lawnmower was probably ten or twelve years ago, and I didn't care for it. I, and went, I tried one recently, and I was like, "This is really good. Why didn't I like this?" Yeah. I went through you know? my IPA stage in the nineties, yeah, and I was over it. 
by yeah. like 99 or 98. Which means you've missed the best IPAs because they've all come out in the last three no, to four no, years. No, no, I only enjoy the best ones. Yeah, the best ones have all come out in the From last Vermont. three to four years. <laughs> From Vermont. I do, the double uh, IPAs that are more yeah. floral. Yeah. I will tell you that, uh, that I... Dude, I was a, an early fan the, of Harpoon, IPAs, which had breweries in Boston and Vermont. <laughs> and uh, I used to hang out with their guys. And the Harpoon IPA was the that was the beer that brought me into that style. I love mm-hmm. IPAs that are balanced well. So I like I say that and then I'm gonna say I like Stone Brewery. Yeah, I don't um, know I don't know how balanced is, Stone is, is but it's wonderful. Stone Brewery is amazing. Wonderful, however yeah. however like some of my favorite IPAs I will tell you is the ninety minute from uh Dogfish Head. I just had one of those uh, last night. Two hearted ale I think is from absolutely yeah. unbelievable. Mm-hmm. And by the way that one like blends with rye, like like forms like Voltron. They're mm-hmm. amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, see, my favorites have a tendency to be more in the hazy side. I love Ghost in the Machine from Parish Brewing, Ghost in the Machine is which good. is wonderful. Uh, I I love St. Arnold's Juicy IPA. I think it's really, mm-hmm. really, mm-hmm. really, really good. And we've had several on the show here recently that have have rivaled those in terms of their wonder and juiciness. Ian, I, I see you, we, and we're wrapping up the show here, but I see you may have wrapped up your. Uh, your tenure. You know, any, when any you final pick up the glass and you think it's your beer glass and you drink the whole thing, <laughs> yes. and you realize it was a shot of whiskey instead, yeah. but mm-hmm. it's still really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's okay. That's mm-hmm. all right. Yeah. Uh, Doug, but I have a beer to toast with. We cannot thank you enough for coming on the that show today. That was amazing. No, thanks thank for you out with us. This has been a wonderful afternoon. And uh, we just, you know, clearly we love whistle pig and and what you guys are putting out but it's just such a wonderful reminder of even just in your line of these things how how much difference there is between the expressions and how much uh, uh how much joy you can find in tasting and, all the way through them and i also love the fact you guys and there's a there's a quality to you know you take the same distillate and you just do different things with it which is kind of fun but the fact that you guys are changing your mash bill and changing and just playing with it from ground up from grain to glass you're playing with it i think is a wonderful wonderful innovative thing i i would agree um you know part of the real reason why i'm still here is because i love the juice i love our brand we don't have the pedigrees we don't have the money to do you know um, tv commercials and talk about you know what our heritage is and where we come from we talk about innovation and just once again pushing and being the you know, high you guys, big of the trough have you guys tried a cold activated bottle Right, maybe or, like that had mountains or, on it that would show people. Or a the, vortex the, bottle, because a lot of the big companies are just like changing the packaging now, right. and they do a vortex bottle, which will make it pour super smooth. Well, that pours really fast. Piggyback. Try it again. Can, Try it again. Can, it goes <laughs> real fast. That's yeah. a speed pour. <laughs> we did. But imagine if it were swirling around. We did like so a many years of innovation to get that speed pour to pour that fast <laughs> yeah. uh, at that exact speed. Uh, I can't tell you well, what maybe, the speed is. Maybe you want to consult the Miller people because, uh, as crazy as that whole vortex idea was. It didn't work. You lift up the bottle no, but, and you just pour it straight out. No, but 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 to your point, every one of these pours pours the same consistency, and Which that's the awesome. key. Yeah, consistency. That's the thing. It's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here. This obviously is wonderful, wonderful stuff. We can't recommend it highly enough, and we appreciate it. And uh, when you do put that next new thing out. We hope you will come back and share some with love us and, and, and talk about it. And so I want to say uh, thanks to our producer, Adam on the Wheels of Steel, for taking care of us here today. Always does such a great job. Thanks to Mary, who handles our booking and uh, correspondence. She's awesome. And uh, Ian, my friend and partner in the show. That's crazy. Uh, this, has been, uh, this has been a blast. Thank you so much. I, Thank I you, appreciate, sir. Uh, I appreciate you riding through this journey with me for 233 episodes. We'll be back for 234 next week. Robert from Iron Root Distilling will be here. And we are looking forward to that. Cheers, y'all.